So, today we're officially starting the renovation. We've been holding off because we had to do our RV tour first, which if you haven't seen that, go check it out. It just kind of goes over the whole RV and uh, some of the reasons why we purchased it. But we're super excited, or at least I am. I'm excited. Okay. I see a lot, you know, I see a lot ahead of us, but I'm excited to get it started. Yeah, and we're excited. <laughs> we chose the truck camper, too, because it's smaller, mm -hmm. and it's going to be a lot easier for us to renovate because there's not as much yes. stuff to actually touch. And I've had the itch to renovate for years now, to be honest. Yeah. And we just didn't have the guts to do it to the fifth wheel, and then by the time we did get the guts to do it... We wanted to get rid of it. <laughs> Yeah, we it started fed, falling we're, apart. Yeah, we were fed up with the fifth wheel. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I'm excited too. Smaller space, I think, you know, ha yeah. what's that saying? How do you eat an elephant? Yeah, one bite at a time. Exactly. So today we're going to just start. It's supposed to rain at some point, so we're just going to do as much as we can. But uh, that's Florida for you. Mm -hmm. We're also trying to renovate this before it gets too hot. It is still <laughs> the springtime. So. Yes. We'll deal with the showers as long as it stays below 100 degrees. And it's only like 70% humidity. Right. Um, but we do also have it plugged in, so we can turn on the AC, yes. which is good. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, first things first, let's get everything out of here that we can. Uh, all of this custom cut carpet and all of this, it just smells like old RV. And if you've ever been in one... You know what I'm talking about. They all have that same old RV smell. I'm sure it's formal formaldehyde. <laughs> um, but sure it's not good for yeah. you. <laughs> but it definitely uh, isn't great. And yeah. so we're going to start by getting these fabrics that really hold yeah. on to that smell out. Yes. And then we're going to take off all of the cabinets. Um and we have a system where we have some painter's tape and we're going to number the cabinet. So we know what number it is. And then we're going to put another piece of tape with the same number like inside the cabinet. So that way we know which cabinets went to which holes yeah. when we eventually get there. Because right now we were like, yeah, that would probably be easy. But I just imagine after we paint it in like three weeks, we're yeah, like, which we're gonna be door holding is it up this? Too, yeah. You know, and then, you know, RVs are finicky. Like even if it's the same size, it might not fit on the other one yeah. as well as it did on the other, on the first one. Anyway, so, okay. No more, no more lollygagging. No more jibber jabbing. <laughs> Let's go. Just like that, we are moving along with the truck camper renovation. So obviously the first part is, is demo and we do know that we have to finish all of this, but we did get the dinette out. There was a couple kind of like hidden bolts and there's still one here in the wall that they screwed in from the other side. So we'll, we'll finish addressing that later. We're just really excited to dig into this part and see the extent of the damage. That being said though, uh, I very much enjoy having all of this open in the demo process because we're doing a very non-damaging demo because we were not sure what we're going to reuse and, and, and whatnot. But uh, it's really interesting because getting everything off, you can actually look into the inner workings of your camper, how the manufacturers ran wires and everything. Like we even 
got access to the top of our freshwater tank by taking off a vent cover, which is gonna be good for something we're doing later. Um, we get access to pretty much just taking these drawers out gave us access to the back of the uh, shower. And so if you have an RV and you don't really know how it works, I really suggest that one of the things you do, um, obviously look at all the different systems you can, but start by pulling out some of your drawers, just like we have here, and taking a look because you can kind of see some of the internals. And that way you can see how it's built and you can prepare yourself in case there's any emergencies on the road. Um, so that being said, we're super excited to get into it. We got a new tool to help us with this renovation. This is a multi-tool. And of course we got Ryobi because that is uh, the battery system I have. And if you haven't seen our Ryobi tool video where we had it in the last camper, go check that out. But let's dive in. Look like, and this is what it should act. <laughs> yeah, and it obviously, if you can't tell, looks like it is coming from the bottom. Yes. And then we did dig in a little bit here. We're trying to see the other side. We uh -huh. suspected the other side was also wet because the delamination yeah it, it was the file on was delaminating so I think we so we dug through the this is all the insulation yeah and we actually think it could be sourcing from the here package door. or honestly it could also be weeping up like from the bottom because the wood is actually exposed on the bottom. It's supposed to be like kind of sealed a little bit, but it is not great. Yeah. So. So it could have been, yeah, it could have been something sourced here from the baggage door, but I mean, I feel like most of the water is actually kind of over here on the, the bottom. It is definitely here. Yeah. But yeah. It's, it's the soggiest over here. All right, so kind of hard to see, but I guess you can kind of see them a little bit. You see these little bumps on the wall? If you ever have those in your RV, <laughs> just know that that is actually mold growing underneath the wallpaper. Ooh. As you can see here. It's mold! <laughs> so there is fungus among us. <laughs> All right. So I think we've identified the definitely the, the damage down there on the bottom. Don't like that mold moving up the wall. So I kind of have two choices and it's either like peel back as much of this wallpaper as we can get, spray like mold control on the good wood and then remove the bad wood. Um, unfortunately, it looks like the bottom is also wet and rotted on the outside, which we kind of knew that because it was delaminating. So um, that's what we kind of dug a little hole through to see the other side. And so we're gonna have to get that wood out and replace it as well. And so, I don't know, I think we're probably just gonna try to replace that whole entire slide wall. Um, I think it'll be a little bit easier because there's only two areas we'd have to cut out and then that way we could kind of just measure the whole wall out, do that, take this wall off, put another one on, but I'm not exactly sure if that's gonna be easier yet. It is time to go do a little bit more YouTube research. All right, so we've watched our YouTube videos and have decided on a course of action here. 
And we actually have already taken a couple of the next steps. So you can see here, this is the size even more off. We were trying to decide whether we can just replace part of the wall and how easy that would be or if we want to just replace the whole thing. And so our major concerns were the fact that the mold went so high up so we would have to replace kind of like from the window down section, both inside and outside. And so that's definitely doable, but I think it's just gonna be easy for us to go ahead and just replace the whole entire wall. And then we do have another option with that too. Um, our first option that I think we're going to try first is to reuse this Phylon that's on here because the Phylon seems to be in decent shape. It's the same shape as all the other Phylon on here. And so it'll keep the consistent old look, although I'm sure uh, we'll probably wrap this in the future or paint it or something to kind of make a nice uh, clean updated look. But, um, so we're, what we're going to do is we're gonna be taking this wall off and then we're gonna to have to scrape everything off and then try to reuse the Phylon to rebuild a wall. And if something happens, we mess up the, the Phylon or anything like that, you can actually buy brand new sheets of Phylon, which is this, what the name of this fiberglass on the outside is, uh, from a couple of sites like recpro.com has some uh, in, in white. And so, yeah, so I guess our, our next step is to, to finish taking off this wall. Uh, just to catch you up on a couple of things we did earlier, um, yesterday when we were investigating this to see how far the damage was and how much work we would have to do, we took off the slide topper. So it just disconnected it there and kind of just rolled it back, put it on top of the slide we took off these edging pieces and so you'll see your your trim here and it just has this nice little l shape and that's pretty much all that covers the edge of your your slide out wall as you can see here it's the two pieces of file on meat and so you just get that little l and that's that trims there and so that just has a couple of screws holding that on and then uh, the only thing holding the Phylon on now is there's a couple of big screws. We have a couple left here that we'll need to take off. And uh, a lot of glue. And so we'll have to try to carefully take this off. I think we'll be able to take this whole entire panel off together um, once we take the screws off at the top and kind of roll back the rubber roof a little bit. And we'll be able to take those screws off and then we'll take this panel off and then we can start cleaning off all of the glue and getting this Phylon unstuck. And then that'll give us a nice clean surface uh, once we, we get all the glue residue off to then start rebuilding the wall with 1 8 glue on, some brand new insulation we bought, and then another glue on board on the inside. So we'll show you that when we get there. But I think for the rest of today, you'll get to watch us just removing the rest of this wall. All right, I'm up here on the roof to show you just removing the trim because we have to remove the trim even on this this top piece here on the roof. Um, so as you can see here, there's all these little screws. And so I just got to go. I got to remove all those screws and then gently pry it up because it has double-sided a turnip on tape that is holding it down still uh, which is good because I thought this was interesting this lance just has like a kind of a bead of sealant here I wonder if that's like Dicor or something uh, and they don't have an Eternabond piece of tape over this connection I think the roof membrane still looks like it's in great shape and I think because it had the slide topper that the seal has held up pretty well, but I know on the grand design, we had the piece of a Eternabond tape and it just made me feel so much better about protecting this seam. So we'll probably do that when we replace this, but now I just gotta go and remove all these screws.
some metal pieces in here, which apparently are to kind of give the, the screws a little something to grab. And it's, <laughs> there, there isn't really a rhyme or reason to where they place them, but uh, definitely gave the multi tool a little run for its money when you would ran, run right into <laughs> a random rectangle that could be two, three feet long, or some of them are just little squares. Some of them, a lot of them you can understand, like this one, it's got holes in it, and you're like, okay, something was screwed into it. But then there's others that didn't have a single screw hole. So maybe those are for other floor plans and they just made their lives easy by making the same wall. Probably. Probably. All right, so something that had been really driving me crazy about this was the bulge on the outside when we were picking it up we knew it was delamination, but we didn't know if maybe it was a beam or something because there just wasn't a bulge anywhere else. Carmen's getting uh, comfortable over here. <laughs> so we finally, now that we got all those freaking metal pieces out, um, yeah, I don't know. So we know now what is causing the bulge, but like we don't know exactly what it is. Cause this is like a piece of paper. Or, yeah. I mean, it's something. It's definitely not wood. Right. Um, if you can't really tell. It's like, uh, I don't know, tape of some sort, maybe? Yeah. But whatever it is has this, like... Pa it's turned into powder. I think that's like a colony of mold or something <laughs> absolutely disgusting, because I think that's Yeah. definitely... Hence why we're wearing our masks. Right. So. This stuff's nasty. Yeah. So we're gonna keep chugging away, but yeah, that's. Yeah, the goal today is to at least get the rest of this stuff out. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so we've uncovered some that wasn't completely powder. Some what? Um, of this <laughs> tape seam. And we've also noticed that there is what appears to be a seam under here. So this is on the outside wall under the phylon, but on the outside of the insulation. So I have no idea what <laughs> was going on here and what this is. Maybe there was a repair done on this side where this baggage door is, maybe it's leaked in the past and they put this piece of tape, insulation, a turnabond. I have no idea what it was, but... Um... Yeah, what's crazy though is like it goes all the way up. It's hard right here, and then it just disintegrates. So it's at least not a mold cesspool. Yeah, that's not... It's, it's I mean, it just, could be, it but... It could be, but it's most likely just really disintegrated whatever like it was insulation to protect this seam yeah which i i don't know that's kind of interesting i don't know why they would insulate the outside of the oh, insulation yeah but it's definitely a lot wetter you can tell the wood here is yeah. it's soft and you know. yeah so. so if it was a repair they didn't do a good job no they didn't they didn't <laughs> fix this the source of the problem <laughs> yeah, tell me about it. All right, so we got the we frame. Got the frame. We got the file on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. As I said to Ray, the easy part's done. Now we have to clean the frame, which I don't think will be the. It'll be a pain in the butt, but it's not going to be the worst job because you yeah. can scrape straight on the metal. But then we are currently, like I was telling you earlier, thinking of reusing the, the phylon. So 
we need to scrape all of that plywood off, that Luan off. Yeah, and it's a lot, you guys. <laughs> I mean, it's a lot. So, it's gonna be a task and a half, and I have to admit, yeah. halfway through even just taking this stuff out, I looked at Jason and I said, you know, $300 <laughs> on a new piece doesn't yeah. sound too bad <laughs> right about now yeah. so that's what I've been saying the whole time <laughs> so we might do that <laughs> yeah um overall though I mean it's not hard no it's it's hard work yeah it's it's not a like no one could do this right it's right it's like it's just muscle and also being delicate at the same time. It's very weird. Yes, yes, definitely. All right, so we are rebuilding the slide wall here and we already have the inside panels on. So I went and I uh, scraped and put adhesive remover and did everything I could to get every single little bit that I could off of the frame of the, the slide wall and it was a pain in the butt. So I ended up actually using our sander and going around with uh, an 80 and a, uh, I even had a 60 grit for a little bit there. And then I put the sander on our multi-tool to really get into little nooks and crannies and really cleaned up the entire frame here. So it's looking um, like it was only built like five or six years ago instead of 15. <laughs> Uh, and then what we did is we bought a new panel. Uh, we didn't get really any Luon or like the Luon we looked at, we didn't really like. It's the 1 8 Luon and it's kind of hard to come by in these big box stores right now. And they just don't make Luon like they used to. Uh, it's actually from a tropical wood and they've already ruined it. Yeah, cut, the down, rainforest. All, yeah. cut down all those good trees. And so now you're mm -hmm. left with a. Uh, uh, the, not the same trees. So we went with this, which is called Revolution Ply, and it is five millimeters thick instead of one eighth, which gets real confusing. And so yeah, it's 1.75 thicker, uh, which I like. And I think the only reason we're gonna be able to do that is because this one goes on the complete outside. Mm -hmm. And so that extra little thickness isn't going to affect like the width of the slide or anything like that. And now this one's sustainably sourced. Yeah. Which and, is a pro. And people have used it for motor, uh, for RVs before and they liked it. And so yeah. I'm, I'm happy to go with a slightly thicker wood because as you all know, that Luan is very, very thin. So anyway, glued it down. We used a polyurethane construction <laughs> adhesive. <laughs> Um, we used Loctite PL, which I looked it up. People said they liked it and it works. It's not going to eat through the wood, the metal, or the next step, which is this insulation foam. Uh, we, we went and we were looking at getting, I was going to get the pink stuff, you know, the XPS foam. And I learned a lot about the different insulation types. Not enough, <laughs> just enough to uh, make it feel like that one looks <laughs> one R better. So I was like, I'm going to get that XPS, Pink Panther, uh, Rigid Foam, and went to the store, went to Home Depot. They said they had it, or Lowe's, and then they didn't. And all they had was this Artec Insulafoam, which is EPS and that's gonna work. I think it's like a one R difference. Not a big deal. So, uh, pretty simple process. We're going to take this and cut it. And then we have another piece and we're gonna take it and cut it. And this is just one inch foam and it fits perfectly in the size of the frame. And we're just gonna glue it all down. Yeah. And I got some low expanding foam to uh for doors and seals so if there does happen to be any gaps or any kind of movement or any of that i will use that low expansion foam to make sure that we have a nice beautiful insulating barrier uh, that nothing can come through so i think we're gonna get started hopefully we don't make too big of a mess yep
We have a vacuum. our first like oopsie and so yeah. <laughs> that was learning that this glue did not hold down the insulation so as you can see here it just uh just comes right up <laughs> so <laughs> we took the whole thing out yeah jason research <clears throat> it was pretty interesting i mean this glue we researched was good for this foam and right there at the edge where the two pieces met, some of the glue got pushed up and it did adhere to the foam, but it did not adhere to that like foil layer and actually left kind of like the greasy squiggles on there. So yeah, I guess that's better than it like sticking in some parts and not in the others, but I was pretty bummed out. Um, and even though this is like the inside wall and we're actually gonna be covering it later, so the way it looks doesn't matter, I just still want a nice solid adhesion because uh, we are going to be putting stuff on it later and so I don't want it to be just adhered at the edges. Right. So we went to the store, did some more research and all of the foam board adhesive that people recommended like Loctite's PL300, all of that, out. It's uh, out in the stores. They, they don't have any. Couldn't even find any online. Not online, not on Amazon, not at Lowe's, not at Home Depot. And we are lucky to have them both relatively close. Uh, they're still further than I would like for doing a renovation project because I find us driving there quite frequently, <laughs> as always. Um, but yeah, anyway, so we, I did a bunch of research and I watched a bunch of videos and apparently gluing foam to plywood is something that people talk about a lot and there is no real great answers um, or videos, but I did find one where some guy tested foam to foam and they used uh, Gorilla Glue construction adhesive and it created a really nice tight bond. So we picked that up and then I actually did switch out and I was able to find, uh, we could probably reuse the previous insulation that we had, the mm -hmm. EPS, but I found this other one, which I forget <laughs> what it's called now, the, the yes. Pink Panther Pink Foam. Mm, yes. So the main differences between these two is they're both one inch. This one is R5 and that one is R3.8. Yes, this is the old one. I don't think you could really see it on yeah, camera. Oh, like kind of. Yeah, yeah, you could you see. see the squiggly lines down there of the glue not adhering whatsoever. So yeah, we wanted this one because it had a better R value. And the first time we went to go buy it, it just wasn't in stock. So maybe yeah. this was secretly a sign. Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, better insulation means the AC hopefully doesn't have to run as much or the heater doesn't have to run as much. And this will be in our main slide on our big slide wall. But mm -hmm. yeah. So round two of insulating the slide wall. Yeah. So we're going to do two things differently. Uh, also, we're going to use that foam um, and then we're going to use that Gorilla Glue. But instead of just laying wavy patterns, we're going to go ahead and apply it down and then spread it. <laughs> We're gonna spread it across the whole thing. Uh, I'm not gonna, I'm not worried about this construction adhesive on here. No, um, it's totally fine. Right, if this was the outside panel and we were gonna put Phylon on it, I don't want like those extra bumps, but because this is on the inside foam and then I do know that we're putting something on the outside, I'm not really worried about having Yes. Uh, a perfect plane if there does happen to be some kind of like variations on the yeah. inside. Exactly. No big deal. I 
right guys, we officially have a wall. So now is the part that I am the most nervous for and that is putting the phylon. Okay, keep getting phylon and luon confused. <laughs> So now we're putting on the phylon. Putting the phylon on the luon. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So we have watched a few YouTube videos and uh, we're ready to give it a go. So we actually bought new, look at this package. <laughs> How long is this, 10 feet? Uh, I think or it's eight, eight? But, yeah. I think it's longer. I mean I think we had to get 10 feet. No, that's the length. So it's like eight feet wide is like just the standard size. Yeah. And then it's, ten, they, had, they sold it in five foot lengths and 10 foot lengths. And we needed like six feet or five and a half or something silly right. like that. Right, yeah, their like smaller one was too small where we would have had to use two pieces and we obviously did not want to do that. So we yeah. had to go to the bigger size. So um, yeah, the delivery guy who dropped it off the other day was like, what? is this <laughs> so yeah we are now going to try and wrangle this thing cut it to not cut it to precise size i kind of figured we'd cut it over mm -hmm. and then we bought these special shears that are meant to cut through it so we can glue it on have the overhang make sure we get all of it and then cut it to size once it's on it and then once that dries, we get to put our wall back up. Oh, well, technically we have to cut the hole for the window. Here yeah, we have the window back in. And then we get to put our wall back up. <laughs> so I guess there's nothing else I can say. I'm, I'm honestly trying to delay because I'm nervous, but we gotta get this started. <laughs> The most graceful. Yeah, of course, you know, as always, YouTube video shows people like nicely, cleanly cutting it with a nice pair of tin snips, which we bought a brand new pair. And uh, yeah, it wasn't nice and graceful. I mean, it cuts through it easily, don't get me wrong. It just uh, kind of cracks, it. Yeah. cracks the fiberglass, so it's like maybe it's the way we're cutting, or maybe, you know, this is our first pair of tin snips, so yeah. maybe we're not using them correctly, I don't know, but, uh, either way, cool. we got it cut. <laughs> It's just, everything's moving very quickly. They, uh, we've seen people apply this. We actually went to the store and got Stay Bond because they recommend that for adding Phylon. And so we called our local RV dealership and they had a bottle and it was like really expensive, but we decided let's get it done. There are other cheaper alternatives that like 3M makes. Uh, that you can get if you plan ahead, but we thought that we were going to use the construction adhesive that we bought, uh, the Proline, anyway, um, but Loctite, but like we were just reviewing the steps we needed to do, and then people were saying to use this like 3M or the Stay Bond or a couple other um, things, and so we decided that we should use the correct stuff and that's why we made that audible however 
it was very stressful. So uh, we watched a couple of videos of people using the stay bond and it looked like it was really, really easy. You know, they sprayed it down on their Phylon and they sprayed it down on the Luon and then they just stuck the two together carefully. But what we failed to realize is that our new piece of Phylon here, because it's been in the tube on a roll, it's got this nice edge to it and wanted to continuously curl up. And so we're like, I don't know how we could lay this thing out and paint it all. So we tried multiple different ways. And then the first time we put it on, it was off a little bit because I don't know, one of the ends wasn't cut flush from us earlier. And so we rolled the whole roll out and it was not covering the Luon. And so we had to like pull it up and unstick it. And that was like, at one point I was like, oh, well, we're just gonna have to put another piece of Phylon to like cover this half an inch thread and Ray said no. So she used her superwoman strength and just ripped the Phylon off. Um, and then we painted more of this contact cement down and it, and that's essentially what it is. It's just a fancy contact cement, but it like, it secures instantly, like so quickly. So then we had to go and we kept painting and moving and painting and moving and painting and moving. And uh, it was, it was very stressful. It's such a big piece. But overall, I mean, I think if we had a shop maybe and some like more clean workspace and we weren't trying to do this, you know, in our yard with like a tarp down and like, it's actually kind of windy here today. So like leaves are falling out of the tree. So it was just like all that added uh, stress. And maybe if we had a paint spraying gun, like they all use in all the videos instead of trying to like roll it on cause the roller was like adhering to the roll panel as all the con, it was, anyway. Absolute insanity. But now what Ray's doing here is she's trimming it up because we aren't the best at getting exact measurements like to the T, but we're really good at cleaning it up afterwards and kind of like finding, uh, you know, detailing it down. And so she has uh, taken our shears and we're making small little cuts. We found that that's the best way to use our tin snips as small little cuts and uh, working her way around the edge. Ron, you're moving faster. I figured out. I figured out how these work. <laughs> so, you're actually supposed to rest the bottom and the piece of metal or phylon is meant to curl up. <laughs> and it actually lets you cut a straight line <laughs> when you use them right. <laughs> so I guess it is important to learn how uh, your tools work. <laughs> All right, we're doing a, a tester. What's wrong? Oh, Jesus, babe. It's... Should we? It's on fire. <laughs> of course. It stopped smoking, at least. <laughs> well, how long have we had this drill? I, this is the first Ryobi tool I ever got. <laughs> we just burnt it to the ground. Yeah, it's done. It's done a lot. It's drilled a lot of holes for us. <laughs> so and it's drilled a lot of screws, and it's done. A, it's done a lot for us. Yeah. Um, started us down the pathway of being able to build our own slide wall. <laughs> but. Well. Uh, I'm gonna keep going until it doesn't work anymore. Well. <laughs> so now that it seems that the fire is out. We can continue. Oh, okay. I don't, I don't quite think that's how it works.
Oh. New day. New day. Exciting day. Exciting day. We're getting our wall back on today. Yeah. So we finished cutting out the window yesterday and uh, today we had to kind of like sand the edges mm -hmm. just to get the fit perfect mm -hmm. and it looks great. There's like one or two places we'll throw a little uh, foam <laughs> in, expanding foam, but other yeah. than that it is perfect. We actually took the wall over there and we test fit it and just as expected because we used slightly thicker wood the wall does protrude a little bit further yeah, than the, the old wall a wee bit. yeah which is fine um uh, it's still all covered by flashings and all of that stuff um mm -hmm. and i think it it looks great the height is perfect and it just kind of fit there like a glove uh, so we'll probably do a little bit of extra waterproofing on the edges yeah. instead of just trying to rely on their little uh, thing. We'll, we'll probably put uh, a turnabond over the entire edge. Yes. And so one thing we noticed with the water damage of the old roof or the old wall was, you know, once it once this is on the wall this actually doesn't like sit on anything. It's exposed. And so this would was exposed and it did have like some sort of old plastic covering on it but it had been ripped probably from maybe the slide coming in and out or you know like it's a 2005 so it isn't gonna last forever so what we're gonna do is actually cover this with um, a turnabond tape and that way this is completely sealed in, completely protected, and we can continue to add a turn on there knowing that it's a weaker spot in this design. Also, another thing we did for just a little bit added stability, as you saw on that one, it had a little one by two beam in there in the frame. This side didn't have anything in there. It was a hollow frame and this is the top. So we went out and bought a little one by one and shoved that in there. So when you drill it in, it's actually gonna drill through metal wood and then metal again. So yeah. so that'll give it a little bit more staying power along the top as well. Which yes. if we could have done it to the sides, we would have, mm -hmm. but they were kind of like, the they were welded so we couldn't get to the ends. Yeah. So that's okay. Yep. We'll take uh, a little bit more on the top. Yeah. If we can. So we have just a few little final touches. We're actually going to peel the plastic back on the phylon, which is very exciting. Um, and yeah, we're not going to put the window in. We took the wall out with the window in, but as we were moving everything around, we realized it would probably be better just to put the wall on first and then put the window on so it's not yeah. as heavy yeah. for us. Save some weight. And then also there's kind of like uh, that fear factor of like shattering the window as you're like trying to move it in. So. Yeah. Yeah. Like I tripped over a sprinkler head during the dry fit. So we're just <laughs> going to play it safe. We're literally in the final stretches here. So I'm yeah. excited to have a wall back on. This has really just been like, I don't even know the right word. Just anxiety inducing knowing that we don't have a wall <laughs> on our camper. Yeah. So we no sooner got our new wall up from all the water damage. I'll put that video up here. 
uh, if you want to see that, we ended up replacing this entire wall, taking it down, rebuilding it, and putting it back. And then we felt this huge sense of accomplishment. And then we found more water damage. <laughs> so, uh, personally, I no longer feel that this previous owner was as nice as I thought. <laughs> we never met him. This was on consignment. So... Which um, probably makes sense why it was on consignment. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I wanted to give this person the benefit of the doubt of like, maybe they didn't know they had water damage here because it was kind of hidden. But now, no. There, there's <laughs> a lot of butyl tape there. It was yeah. kind of like they just kept adding more and they, that's how they tried to solve the problem. Yeah. Anyway. So anyway, that doesn't matter. What's done is done. Uh, we still love the camper, still love the layout. Yeah. So here's our, our uh, next giant repair <laughs> yeah so this one's gonna be a little bit more difficult but uh this one tool that we got actually told us that this one is not as bad we're not going to take off the entire back wall no i don't think that is something we would want to undertake anyway i mean i'm sure we could it's just you know i don't, I want, don't to. want to yeah <laughs> really don't want to um but this tool that we got right here is a pinless i'm gonna call it a water detector but i feel like it's like a humidity sensor or something it's got like mm -hmm. an actual name but uh and we'll we'll have it linked down below yes. but it was 40 bucks and it's pinless um because the other ones usually have these two little pins that you mm -hmm. jab into the wood and then you get these little pin marks all over the wood right you don't um, really want to be doing that on no. the exterior of your rv <laughs> yeah or i mean on the interior either you don't want to have a bunch of pinholes in the wall but this one will tell you uh if it's dry or wet it's just straight through the wall and then it helps you gauge how wet and where <laughs> yeah um, how bad things really are <laughs> so if you are looking at a new rv or mm -hmm. trying to gauge whether or not you want to tackle a renovation like this mm -hmm. uh, get one of these and it will show you exactly where the water damage is um and how how bad it is so yes. It's pretty simple. You just turn it on and you put it on the wall, let's say up here. And so it's a 6%, which is dry. And then you just go down the wall and oh. 18, 20. Oh. It's still saying dry. Oh. And then oh. what? Yeah, we're at 73 down here, guys. <laughs> so then, you know, 42. And it's quickly. So for us, I mean, it goes all the way down. Yeah. Uh, so about here mm -hmm. is all we need to yes. replace. And I think that's pretty much across the board here. Yeah. And I'll take you under the RV too. So we kind of felt like a little delamination here. And we're like, oh, uh, you know, it's not that bad. <laughs> It's bad. <laughs> so we dropped the underbelly. Uh, we did this for another reason. We were just trying to get under here and see stuff and where we're gonna put our batteries. But once we dropped that, you could really see. So this is our bumper. And then here's like the frame that the wall sits on. And here's the wall. <laughs> I got okay. So here's the wall. Nice and gooey. <laughs> so kind of peeled it back here to take a peek. Definitely yucky, moldy, wet. Whoops. So that's what we're looking at here, guys. And thankfully though, it doesn't go super high. Carmen is chasing lizards under here. <laughs> Did you find one? Carmen, leave them alone. And don't send them over here. Hey. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so that's the situation. So once again, turn to YouTube. And we saw someone actually do like a full wall repair 
and the wood surprise if and it looks it was the same type of uh, rig that we have so the wood actually goes up to here and then it was like foam up here so they replaced like that whole the whole piece of wood from the window down so what we're gonna do is we're gonna drop the bumper which oh, we really didn't want to do but this metal piece of trim that's in here is actually screwed in from the bottom so we have to drop the bumper to get to those yeah. to get that trim off so we're going to drop the bumper unscrew that trim unscrew the bottom of the ladder we already as you can see took off this trim because we wanted to like assess the damage in here so this wood is actually like okay it really is like the bottom you know uh, six inches to a foot that's just like not looking good so since we know how to build a sidewall, and we're, we've, we've learned uh, what to do and what not to do. Yeah, learned a thing or two already. <laughs> we're gonna just remove the ladder, remove the bumper, remove the trim, and we're gonna cut out the bad wood. We're gonna rebuild a wall on the fly, put it in there. We gotta peel off all the bad wood off the phylon. Yep. So we're gonna reuse the same phylon. We're not putting new phylon nope. on. And then we're just gonna glue it back down and put everything back together. Sounds easy enough, right? Yeah, just as easy as that. So, <laughs> let's get started. goodness okay <laughs> so we got all the bolts out <laughs> and two broke which we didn't think anything of but that's what was giving us all those problems of getting it off so here's the bolt here's one that broke off and here's the other that broke off and it just made getting this thing off such a pain but we got it off and we can now see the screws that holds this piece of trim on. So we're gonna lower this enough so we can get in there and get that trim off. Next step. <laughs> Rebuild the wall. <laughs> no biggie. All right, guys. So, you can see Ray's under here, surrounded by rotten wood, or wet wood, I guess. Uh, luckily, I don't see as much mold as I was expecting, but the wood is definitely still damp, so uh, it has recently gotten wet. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, as we were hoping, based on our moisture meter and everything else, it doesn't seem like that much damage, or, or at least it's not that high up. We actually even had problems peeling up the, the phylon and points because the wood is still really good and the adhesive was really good. But we were able to get it up just far enough, and then you see we have this like bungee cord thing holding the ladder out. Let's go into this fence here. Um, and we just slowly worked away at it. We get, we did give up like three or four times today yep. and it rained on us twice. Yep. And we had to make one run to Home Depot. But overall, I think we made great progress. We learned a lot with 
the the door or yeah. the slide wall. So. Yep. So now we're in the final stages. We are. And we're gonna try this glue remover. Yep, adhesive remover. So. See how that works. Yeah, and so uh, pretty much the next steps are to uh, pretty much it goes Phylon, Luon, Foam Insulation, Luon, uh, but the inside Luon isn't visible anywhere. It's like in the basement. So I don't know if we're going to replace that or what we're going to do, but we're at least going to clean off the Luon with that adhesive remover, make it nice and clean for a nice smooth bonding surface. We're going to, I've already cut a piece of foam insulation. Uh, that we had left over from trying to build our sidewall and uh, so we're gonna fit that in and then we're gonna cut another piece of outside Luon we're gonna glue this stuff all together and uh, we should have a nice sturdy back wall again really excited uh, I think based on where the extent of the water damage is that we've discovered we do believe that these steps like where they screw into the wall here or at least this corner. It was definitely coming from this corner. So we were kind of worried about this window because on the inside there was a little bit of water damage on the counter, but like not on the wall or anything. But oh. so we we're kind of wondering like, oh no, like was it dripping all the way down? But the damage was definitely the worst over here in this corner. Yeah. So I don't know. Anyway, so uh, time to get back to work because we're burning daylight. I have washed off all that mold and ick that I covered myself in. So we got the Phylon scraped off pretty good. That 3M adhesive remover though didn't do anything. So definitely don't recommend that. Um, I would say that's a testament to the adhesive that Lance used though, because that stuff, <laughs> my hair's been crazy for a while. But, yeah. uh, the lance adhesive is incredibly strong. Yes. And if the wood didn't rot, like if it was metal to metal, There's I don't think no we would have never gotten that off. No. Yeah. So we did scrape off a lot of the wood from the Phylon, and then we actually went in there with our sander and we sanded it. So I think it's actually in pretty good shape. So now what we're doing is we, oh God, I can't reach. <laughs> <laughs> We cut a cardboard box to size and tested it in there and it fits really well. So now yeah. we're going to go ahead. Look at this. It's just a little. Yeah. yeah. So that's all the wood. That's the size of the wood we're replacing. So also <laughs> we got one eighth Luon. We found it. It was yeah. called utility panel. Um, and there was one at the third closest Home Depot to us. <laughs> yes, so we actually built our side wall that we already put back on with five yeah. millimeter rev ply. Which is like just a little bit bigger than one eighth. And one eighth is 3.75 millimeters. Yes. Right. So anyway, I'm actually glad we built it with a little bit thicker material just because it, it feels a lot sturdier. This is so flimsy. So. Yeah, and we would have just used the rev ply except for yeah. we're putting it next to existing panel, so you you would be able to see the different thickness. It would just stick out. Yeah, <laughs> would. It'd be silly. yes. So that's why we went and got the thinner plywood for this. So uh, now we're cutting out the sh shape that we have already determined what we need, and then we're gonna be able to glue it back in. And are we gonna try and glue the phylon on tonight? Or are we gonna let? I don't think so. Okay. It's. I'd like to. I but... would like to as well, but yeah. it is seven o'clock, seven p.m., and I think we should wind down. We can glue that first thing tomorrow. Just get this done. Well, I know. I but know. We can glue this <laughs> plywood on tonight. Yeah. And and put the clamps on and yeah. let it set and yeah. hold. All right. Fine. And then tomorrow we'll do it. Okay.
So it was a two-man job getting that big piece in there. Uh, so we didn't film it. So you get to see this part. <laughs> and this is just the corner piece that goes right in here. But you could see the other piece right here. So, uh, yeah, what we've been uh, doing here is just applying a little bit of glue. And sticking it on. So, you know, whoops, real complicated work. We may or may not have also had a couple of seltzers. <laughs> but, you know, whatever gets you through. All right. So, I'm also going to just put a little bit on. Oh, God. The angles on this thing. <laughs> I bet you there's like some professional contractors out there right now that are watching this and cringing. That's okay. That's okay. The purpose of this is not <laughs> for any structural or anything. It's literally <laughs> to right. get the mold and mildew out. And we never said we were how-to people. Yeah, don't do not do it how- do This is showing you what we're doing, not- <laughs> Not necessarily that it is the you, yeah. right way. If anything, it might be a how not to. Right. Look at that. Woo! Now that we have that on there, we are going to take... What is that? A, what is that? A 4x8? 2x6. 2x6. That's longer than six feet. It is an eight foot long two by six. Two by six, eight feet long. I think I'm lying. There's three dimensions here, baby. <laughs> I don't think you're lying. Okay, you have I'm just you realizing. I'm, <laughs> I'm just realizing a few things. Okay. Anyway, so we're going to take Wait, you this. thought two by fours were four feet long? <laughs> I genuinely don't yeah. know what I thought. Yeah, okay. That's fine. <laughs> okay. It. Yeah. It's been a long day. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take this two by four. Two by six. <laughs> All right. So we're going to take this two by six and put it on here. <laughs> yeah, with clamps. Yeah, with clamps. To Man. Pull it down. The, the detail truly goes downhill the later in the day it gets and the more seltzers we have. So today is gluing day and we came out here, we took off uh, the piece of wood that we strapped on here overnight and it looks really good. Yeah. So we also took like little shims that we had. Just regular wood shims. Yeah. And threw these in some of the spaces that weren't exactly flush against that uh, piece of wood and so it's looking really good. Yeah, I think that helped a lot make sure mm -hmm. we get a nice even pressure. Yes, yeah, so the glue is nice and dry and then I wanted to show you here just what it looks like with the old wood and the new wood. So we got those two butted up against each other in here. I hope you can see that. I feel like it's a little dark, but oh well. Um, so yeah, here's the Here's the old wood, and here is the new wood. So we got that new wood all the way across, looking good. We have to get one, we're gonna cut one more piece of wood that just goes right there, and then that's held in by this little L, oh no, this one, this little L piece of 
trim that then gets screwed on. Yep. And then we're gluing the Phylon back down. And I think we can put the trim back on, put the bumper back on, we're done. Yeah, and, and for, for glue, we are yeah. using the same stuff that uh, they recommend, it's Stay Bond T440. This stuff is expensive and it sticks fast. Uh, go watch the, once again, the slide wall if you wanna watch some chaos. Yeah, um, so I feel like we got a better handle of how this thing works. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully this, this time around won't be as chaotic. <laughs> but other than that, uh, Let's get to gluing. Yeah. I'm ready to have this project done so we can actually start moving on inside to some of the bigger projects that we need to finish before paint. And then once paint is done, we're going to be in good shape. <laughs> But that's okay because we're done. Whew. So this was definitely a project and a half, but I'm proud of us. Yeah. And we sealed it up nice and tight with some butyl tape. And then obviously we're going to put sealant on top of that. Uh, we didn't do the sealant just yet, but we're going to cover it with a tarp because that would be pretty annoying to do all this <laughs> uh, water damage work. And then get more water damage. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, I'm happy with it. Yeah. There's like one, it's really dirty right now because our hands are dirty and you know, we've been hammering and stuff, but there's one spot right here that like, it's actually good wood underneath. And so you can still kind of just see a lump, even though we put glue there because that's just kind of where like, when we peel back the phylon, it it kind of like made that. Yeah, that. it was it was like where the the phylon was adhered the best, and so yeah. as we were trying to like pull it up and keep it up there, it kind of creased the phylon up a little bit. But that's okay. Yeah, we know that it's good wood, and so even that minor little bit of yeah, it's bump, cosmetic. Yeah, exactly. And we're okay with that. At least we know we got good wood under here, and this all this side all adhered really well. Yeah, All right. solid wood. So it's starting to really come down. We better cover this up. But um, yeah, don't forget to like this video and subscribe to join our getaway gang. We'll see you next time. Bye, Bye guys. guys. All right, so today I am hoping to get my two accent walls done because that is a big project that needs to get done before we paint, since obviously we want to paint our accent walls with all of the material up there. So the first wall that we're going to be working on, I started working on it last night and I'm glad I did because I already learned a few tips and tricks, like literally those four pieces of wood that you see in the background took me hours. <laughs> so. We're gonna go a lot faster today, um, but that's just gonna be right above our bed. That's like this geometric, you know, accent wall. And then over here in our slide, we're going to have shiplap, but instead of your traditional um, horizontal shiplap, we're gonna do it vertical. And so I learned a thing or two yesterday when I was quickly, before the thunderstorms came, cutting the wood. So I decided to do five inch um, wide pieces of shiplap that will just go up on the wall like so. Obviously the dog bed is in the way here. So we'll get that up and then we're just gonna paint these like you would the rest of the camper. Um, and this material is actually, is it Renogy? Why do I always say that? That's a battery company, isn't it? Yeah, it's Revply. Revply. I don't know why my brain, like I do that with words that start with the same letter. Anyway, so mm. that's just what, is it one eighth or no, if this it's, is the five millimeter. Yeah, it's the five millimeter. So slightly thicker than the one eighth glue on, the same that we use for the sidewalls. Um, yes. 
Yeah, and it makes a great lightweight fake ship lap because yeah. I think ship sh true ship lap is like the cut. It's kind of yeah. like a tongue and groove cut. It interlocks. But yeah, um, yeah. so this will. Yeah, faux, this is our faux ship lap because it's lighter. Because we did look at the real like ship lap interlocking pieces of wood, but they were just too heavy. Yep. So when we put this up, you kind of just put a little spacer in between before you put the next one up and then bada bing, bada boom, you got fake ship lap. So we definitely want to get both these projects up today because we're starting to really run down on our timeline clock here. So we need to get to painting and I feel I'll feel a lot better once we get the painting step done. But to get there, we have to get all this other stuff done. So let's get started. <laughs> moving along. Look at all these angles. So I wanted to briefly go over the tools that I'm using for this job. And are these the best tools for the job? Honestly, probably not. But you got, you got to work with what you have. So we have our saw. And what's really cool about this that Jason found it, um, when he was in Home Depot one day was that it cuts at 45 degrees, 22 and a half, and then obviously straight. So that's what I've been using. I've been using the 45 to get like these angles. Um, and then I sanded the walls beforehand just because we are going to paint and so some of the videos that we're watching they want you to sand first so I obviously sanded first and you can see the difference. I only did this edge here because I'm just going to come through and do everything else later but you can definitely see the difference between a sanded wall and a non-sanded wall in the RV. And then we have Bradley. <laughs> that is what we've named our Brad nail gun. Um, and that is what I'm using to obviously stick these pieces of wood onto the wall. You could use wood glue as well, but yeah, I figured Bradley could get the job done. And then I don't know the exact proper name of this tool because Jason just handed it to me yesterday when I was kind of freaking out about how annoying it was to measure these pieces of wood especially when both ends need 45 degrees it is it is a nightmare to try and measure those properly so um this has like a little laser on it and you can see on here it has the degrees so when i need to get in these weird corners like i just used it over here where both ends need 45 degrees this is pretty handy because you can just you know put it in here put it at whatever you need and then I go and I mark like where I want the other side to be or I mark where the other side needs to be and then I come in here with my measuring tape and then I will measure the distance between where I want to be and where I need to be and then that's what I've been cutting my wood to and frankly like that's not perfect I'm still kind of off but it gets me close enough because yesterday I was like trying to measure these 45 degree cuts and it was truly a nightmare. And I feel like there's gotta be an easier way to do this, but I don't know it. So I can't tell you what that is. But once again, we're working with what we have and we're getting the job done. So I think I'm almost done. I really think I'm only gonna put like maybe three or four more tiny pieces of wood up here. Um, I'm gonna make one more little triangle shape on this side and then you really can't see this side because this is our closet, 
but I don't want just that empty hole so I might just put two more like diagonal pieces in there and then I think we're gonna call it a day. I was gonna put some like <sighs> diagonal pieces down here but then measuring it and looking at it from further away our bed is gonna be six inches high and then obviously you're gonna have your pillows and you're gonna have your sheets. So you wouldn't even see any pieces down here. So I don't think I'm gonna torture myself and add those pieces down there that we'd never see. So, and I think that this is, you know, a statement piece enough. I don't really think those little pieces will add anything extra. So that's where I'm at, almost done here. I feel like there was one other thing I was gonna tell you about this, but I forgot. So if I remember, I'll come back to you. great. I'm really excited to see it painted <laughs> whenever we get to that step. So now I am moving on to the shiplap wall and as I said yesterday I already cut different pieces. I did not cut enough. I didn't beat the thunderstorm so it was a mad dash to get everything back inside. Um, so I will be cutting a, a little bit more uh, shiplap pieces today or faux shiplap. Um, and then yeah, I'm hoping to just get this box completely filled out today and then these two big projects we can mark as done. So uh, one last thing on the geometric wall that I wanted to talk to you guys about. So if you're interested in doing it yourself or something similar, um, these are, this is the pieces of wood I used. They are originally, I don't know, eight, 10 feet long, but eight. Okay, but uh, you can find them in the trellis section in Home Depot or Lowe's. I think this was Home Depot. Those were Lowe's. <laughs> Those were Lowe's. Oh my goodness. We have been to Home Depot and Lowe's, it feels like a million times in these past few weeks. So, trellis section of Lowe's, and they're a little less than one by one, um, but I think. Normally you do a bigger piece, you do like a two by one from everything that I looked up when I was looking up geometric walls. But I feel like in an RV, those were just a little bit too big and we did go look at them and I kind of laid them out on the, in the aisle way to kind of make a pattern and see if we liked it. But again, I just think it was a little bit too big. So we opted for the smaller one by one sizes size. So then as far as the pattern goes, I actually just, went online and I tried to look at a bunch of different patterns and just see what kind of vibe I was going for um, and what patterns kind of appealed to me. And I think if you're gonna do a project like this, <laughs> you should map it out just a little bit, not 100% because I feel like I'm glad I didn't go commit 100%. So I kind of just did this silly little sketch. Um, because I knew right off the bat looking at my space, there's these cabinets go to the back wall. And so I didn't have like a full square. So that's actually why I opted to do this side piece. Oh, you can't see it, but that side piece back there because that matched up with these cabinet things and then I could actually kind of work with a full square there. So just, you know, get a good feel for your space, find the weird angles because you're gonna have weird angles in an RV and then kind of work from there. And then that's where I kind of, those are the blue lines for me, <laughs> just so I could map out my square. And then I kind of just started playing with different shapes. And again, what I wrote down here is not what we ended up going with. I kind of changed a couple things on the fly. Once things were on the wall, I realized I didn't have as big of a space. So instead of doing, you know, like four sideways lines, I only did three in this main triangle. So 
I wouldn't map it out 100%. You really gotta feel your space and see if you're digging the way it's laying out or change a couple things as you move along. So those are my tips and tricks that I learned doing this project. Now, completely out of breath, ready to turn the AC back on and get started on this. finished this wall. I'm not gonna lie, this was harder than the geometric wall. Um, mostly because of the corners around these, around this window frame. This was a little tough, just, to, just because, first of all, nothing's straight. So the window obviously is not perfectly straight and then these boards as hard as I try are not perfectly straight so then trying to cut the curved edge around it just adds this like additional layer of complexity and then I kind of cheated here so they're all five inches except this piece and that was because I started from this side and there's like a bigger gap in the corner here, but we're gonna put some trim there because the wiring for this light is on this corner. And previously, like from a manufacturer, they had a piece of trim there, but it looked kind of weird not having the same matching trim over here. So anyway, we're gonna put a piece of trim in each corner, but being able to do that and have that bigger gap that I'm gonna hide with the trim, I was able to put this plank like right up against the window, which made it nice. And then, you know, getting these two curves was super painful. And then, okay, you kind of like get it down. You get all these planks up. And then I came down here and I realized, okay, if I'm keeping it five inches wide, I'm gonna have to cut the entire window frame out of one long plank. And while that was possible, this was already taking me so much longer than I wanted. And I was getting so frustrated with these corners because it took me honestly like four tries per corner. So I had already wasted like eight pieces of wood trying to get the shape that I needed. And I just knew that it was going to be even harder with an entire plank. So I opted to have this plank line up with the window and then just make this a, sh a shorter plank. And that way I only had to deal with the two corners instead of an, a whole piece. So obviously not perfect, but I feel like once it's painted, you can't really tell. And because I Brad nailed them in, if I hate it, I'll just fix it later, you know? So anyway, yeah, this was a lot tougher than this stupid geometric wall. I was very surprised. I thought this was gonna take me like, I don't know, an hour, but it took me like half of a day. So that's okay. It better look good painted because right now it's giving me like temporary classroom vibes. I don't know if your school ever had those where they put up those like temporary classrooms, but I feel like they used this type of plywood because that's what it feels like. Anyway, so now that that's done, we are one step closer to painting and I wanted to show you my last little, um, I guess it's another geometric wall, sort of. So up here in the stairs to get up, we ripped up the flooring and behind, this was all carpeted. And so behind here is just like um, metal, planks and then um there's this is a storage and it, it's really long so this is our underbelly but the storage goes all the way to the back so we just took out this so we could actually like repair the wall over here um which i can put that video up if you guys are interested repairing our back wall because that was a task and a half also but anyway so once we put this back in we'll just have this long drawer here so, because we ripped out the carpet and it was just this like metal wood behind it, 
by the way, I don't know if you noticed this, this is not mold. Every time I look at it, I think it's mold. It's like leftover glue. Um, I peeled off all the paper down here and then I decided I don't need to peel off the paper up here because it's just really annoying and taking me forever. So anyway, so we put up more of this plywood around the edges and then I kind of just started playing with it already, but I took more trellis pieces and these are much thinner. They are not the one by ones. These are, I think one by, I have no idea, four millimeters. Anyway, so, and I'm using our Bradley nail gun to put these up. And this has no template or guide that I'm following. I've kind of just decided to wing it because it's such a small space and I'm not gonna overdo it. So I put up and I'm gonna just mirror whatever I do on one side, I'm just gonna do on the other side because that makes it easier to cut, easier to plan. And then this is just kind of gonna be like our little entry geometric staircase because we didn't know what else to do here. Um, yeah, and having all the carpet there and all that glue underneath, we knew we just needed to hide the whole thing. So this was our solution. And I think it's gonna look really good. So I have my little saw here. I have a couple pieces already cut and I'm gonna just finish this project up. That's what I'm just gonna end up with here. Simple enough for me. Little statement piece right when you walk in. So uh, next is to paint. So we need to get this storage drawer back in. Maybe I'll do something on the front of that. Not quite sure yet, but I gotta go hunt down Jason because I think we're ready to sand and prime. This day has felt like a long day coming. we have made it to the prime step <laughs> feels like yeah. a long time coming big day big day uh here on forward i think it's like you're cresting that hill I... so like up to here you're yeah. kind of like doing a lot of stuff and it just looks like a torn apart rv but now it is i think the fun part where we're starting to put it all back together mm -hmm. and then once it's re once it's painted Mm -hmm. or primed and then painted it will start to feel like it's actually been renovated <laughs> right yes so yesterday evening we took the time to pr do our prep work so we sanded we've kind of been sanding over the last couple days like whenever either one of us had a chance like we'd come and do some sanding but then we actually last night like came in and did all of the detail sanding all of the corners and then we washed the walls with TSP and then we wiped them down a second time so we let it all completely dry out overnight and so now we're ready for prime so it does feel good to be in here with it being like really clean because <laughs> yes. it's been so dirty well and even just from picking it up right like it's 15 years of other people's <laughs> filth in here yes. and so you know and when you have an rv like you know there's dirt and there's sawdust from when they first like made the unit mm -hmm. and so we're cleaning out as much as that as we can yes and it's actually been really nice to get that like extra dirt and grime by taking out like all of the appliances and the countertops because we're able to get in here with a vacuum and get out dirt that you can tell has been in here for a long time so um today we are priming and so we are actually using hold this <laughs> benjamin moore's yes sticks so this says bonds to hard to coat surfaces 
So, uh, if you know anything about painting RVs, they would definitely be considered a hard to coat surface. And if you've seen our sanding job, it might look like crap, but we have learned that that's actually okay. You're really just trying to get that first, you know, surface rough and you don't need to worry about like the, having like an equal amount of um, sanding done, if that makes sense. So like, obviously some parts look a little bit more white than others and we've learned that that's totally okay. So we're, uh, you know, we'll let you know if that's not okay, but it's a lot more apparent on like the cabinetry because, you know, this is like that plywood and then they put that almost like wallpaper material that looks like wood over it. So you don't want to sand it enough that you go through the paper, but you definitely want to sand it enough that you can paint it. So that's why it's important to come in here with the detailed sanding and make sure you got every single edge because you really just kind of want to rough up like every surface. And so what we're pretty curious about that I haven't really seen covered in any of the RV renovation slash painting videos that we've been watching is we have a lot of these plastic pieces. So they're actually over like the doorways. Every corner piece is a plastic piece and in every cabinet tree entry door is like this plastic. So we scuffed this up as much as we could with the sandpaper and we'll see how it paints. We are finally to painting yep. and I'm so nervous. <laughs> I feel like up until this point, like if you mess something up or it wasn't perfect, you could be like, well, that's fine. You fix it later. That gets covered up. And so now it's like the thing that can't be covered up. <laughs> but you can always fix it. True. So I think, True. I think this is definitely uh, one of the cases of you're making yourself nervous. Well, maybe. Yeah. We painted Although, a lot of stuff. I mean, it primed really well. It took a long time, so we did switch it up. Yes. Priming took us like five hours. Five hours of rolling and brushing on, and like this is a truck camper, so it's not big. <laughs> and it was so, miserable. Like but, we actually had to take a couple of days. Or I had to take a couple of days off because literally, like my muscles in my hands and my arms were so sore from rolling. <laughs> So we decided to buy a sprayer mm -hmm. and make it easier on ourselves, which required us to then go and recover and yeah. prep everything. But uh, we did spray the front of the cabinets with primer the other day and it went by so fast. <laughs> like so a couple minutes. <laughs> we're we're kind of excited to see how fast we can paint this whole thing and yeah. I think that's a big lesson yeah. learned already like if you're thinking about doing this I'm gonna recommend spraying a thousand times over rolling because yeah. we opted to roll and like the primer was so painful that I knew I can't do this again <laughs> yeah I would say so far out of all the things that we've done uh, the, the number one thing that I would probably pay someone else to do it's is paint. paint. Yeah. yeah. I mean, Only because, and it's not just the paint, it's the whole process. It's the sanding, the cleaning up the sand, then the priming, then the sanding again, then the cleaning up the sand, yeah. then the painting, then the sanding, then the cleaning up the sand. It's really yeah. like the paint isn't even the worst part, in my opinion, like the sanding and cleaning up the sanding is the worst part. Yeah. And we're not even through it. And I think, I, you know, it's one of those words like, sure, if you have like big walls and maybe you could like roll these huge walls, you might be right. able to do it faster. But like, there's so many nooks and crannies. And of course, nothing is ever like 
clean and like large sizes so like you can't get like a small four inch roller into these nooks and then you have to brush them and it's just yeah anyway. yeah it's not like painting a house at all and i feel like that's what we've been you we've been used to painting yep. and so this is like a whole new experience and it's the prep work that is so time consuming even even covering all these windows and like covering the accent wall behind the camera here like covering the fridge like we have to cover everything because we're going to spray but spraying is so worth it because of all the work that goes in between rolling. So yeah. anyway, yeah, the whole painting process from start to finish is so time consuming and like exhausting. I am so tired. I can't even yeah. express to you how tired I am I from this particular work. Like taking off a slide wall, getting rid of mold, like building a slide wall from scratch is nothing now compared <laughs> to just painting. Yeah, and it's so funny because like it, just even the primer in here, like putting a white on the walls, like really, really makes the space yeah. feel huge. Yes. Um, and like, I would say even skip painting, but I think it's so necessary. Oh yeah, yeah so it's necessary. Unfortunately. It's gonna change the whole look. Yeah. Even the prime looking like garbage, like makes this tiny little space look so much bigger. So I'm very excited. It is like the number one thing you can do to change your space, but it is, hard work so that being said <laughs> we have delayed enough mm -hmm. let's get to it So before I can paint, Jason has informed me, <laughs> the cupboards inside, I, we need to change out this fresh water fill. So even though it's on the passenger side of the RV, this is where we would fill our fresh water. So since this rig is an older rig, we decided that it would probably make us mentally feel better to have a clean, uh, you know, entry point for our fresh water as well as a new hose. Our fresh water tank is somewhere right here, right? Like directly under, which would make sense. So we can actually change out this hose a lot easier because our stove is out right now. So this is actually on the inside. We'll show you the inside too, but this is like kind of where our stove is. So it's really easy to change this tube out right now. We have really easy access to it and we're able to reach down underneath and reach it to the underbelly because the underbelly is dropped right now. So figured might as well change this now before I start painting and we risk ruining the paint, changing the hose. I didn't tell you this. Me? Yeah, and you. Them. Oh. And them. Uh, the one that we got to go here is mm -hmm. just slightly larger. 
Like and we're going to have to cut a hole? We're going to have to enlarge the hole. Nothing can ever be easy, huh? <laughs> Someone lost it from their hose and it's just been sitting in that pipe. Yeah, very, very crumbling. Just drinking a little bit of plastic and what's in there? I don't know. Looks like a reducer of some sort. I don't know, try to pull it out. Really? I think that's probably just like a, yeah, it's like a little bung. I don't think we'll need that, we'll see. Is there a bung hole in our water? <laughs> Oh no, this turned off. <laughs> Just blowing hot air. Yeah. At the AC, which yeah. is then pulling it down. Alright, let's get this through. The white is done. We've taken a little bit of a break, so I don't actually even know the last thing we said to you guys, but the second layer of white looks really good. I do have a couple, two actually, like spots where it's really drippy, um, but I know we can sand that down and kind of fix it again. So doing the interior with the spray gun was so much easier. I can't even describe like how much that is worth the money. <laughs> um, and I do feel like it gives it a better end result. There's obviously no brush marks, no anything weird. The only thing obviously is like the drippy paint, which, you know, this is the other spot. I don't know if you guys can see it. I'll try and get a close up shot, but overall it looks really good. Those drippy spots are fixable. So today I'm going to be doing the accent wall and our cabinets. So those are going to be painted in black. We're using the same Scuff X um, from Benjamin Moore and the paint color that we picked is called Ebony King. Uh, they did have one more shade of black that was just like pure black black, but we decided to do like the one shade lighter. We'll see if it makes a difference. We just thought it looked a little bit better with like this shade of white. So that's what I'm gonna be doing. I feel like I've been procrastinating this part of the project for so long. And it's just because it's such a dark color, I'm a little bit scared, but I need to just get over it and do it because I have this vision in my head and I need to see if it's gonna come to fruition. So time to get started. One minute in and I already got it on the white.
it's the next day. Um, I painted the accent wall and it looked royal blue. I mean, even a little bit darker than royal blue. So that wasn't gonna do, <laughs> cause that's not the vibe we're going for here. So we ended up going back to Benjamin Moore, talking to, to them about it, asking if they could tint the Ebony King like just black. And unfortunately they can't because they use different colors. Um, and what's weird is like Ebony King doesn't even have any blue in it. So I we actually think it's from like the skylight. We closed it, but um, yeah, it just had a blue hue. So anyway, we ended up buying black, black. <laughs> and what's so funny, I don't think it's going to translate on camera very well, but when I painted, I so I came back and I did a second coat of black, black, and it still looked bluish, but now that it's the next day and it's dried, it does look black. And it's only like this wall, and I think it's just because we get all this light here, we get all this light here, that it's just picking up on the blue sky, the blue hues, because... Um, I did end up doing the first coat of black on our lower cabinets and those look black and in some, however, in some light though, they can look a little bit blue. So it's something going on in here. It's something with the room and like we installed these lights. Let's see if I can. <laughs> so you can either have like a yellow hue or a blue hue. So at first we thought it was like, oh, it's the lights uh, making it look blue. But when we go like back to this neutral color, it's really the outside lights that are affecting it. So that's fine. I'm good with it. As long as I know my paint is like black and when I compare it to our black appliances, it won't look blue, I'll be okay with that. And I think it'll be a little bit different once we get the blinds up in here. We won't have all of this exterior light just, you know, coming in here, which is great to have, I'm not complaining. So that's where we're at. Um, I'm about to do, I don't know if you can even see this on camera, but there are like um, little white, Spots still coming through and that's because I went ahead and I already did the sanding between this layer and I also sanded you can really see it here but I also sanded um, this first layer on the lower cabinets as well and we're actually painting god the bathroom <laughs> we're painting the one cabinet in the bathroom black as well this bathroom. I'm so ready to be done with it. Anyway, so that's where we're at. I'm gonna go ahead and do the second coat on everything, see how it covers. Um, possibly might need to do a third coat, I don't know. But anyway, time to get to it. super pleased with how the paint turned out, but of course we can't show you everything right now. We're gonna leave you hanging and show you the final results in our post renovation walkthrough video. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel so you don't miss that one. It's gonna be good. All right guys, exciting day here. Uh, Ray is actually gone. She had to go and fly back to Los Angeles. And so I'm taking this opportunity to install our electrical system. All of the products from Battleborn arrived, so we're ready to go. And I think I have everything I need. Um, I did have to make a couple of last minute Amazon purchases, but that always happens because I don't 100% fully flesh out what we're working on. Anyway, uh, I have already started the, the build a little bit and uh, not by installing anything but by kind of preparing the area so let's go inside um, I'll show you the first part of this project which was uncovering kind of the systems and where all the wires went 
and then uh, that let me kind of work with Battleborn to build the system that we needed. Oh boy, uh, it's hot in here because we're in Florida and it's just hot in general. It's been thunderstorming and so it's about 90 or 86 degrees. Uh, we have a dehumidifier in here. Uh, which has an electrical cord running outside because all of the electrical off is off in the rig um, so that I don't have to deal with shocking myself. But that also means that our AC is off as well. So uh, you'll probably see me progressively having more and more sweat on me as this video continues, but you got to do what you got to do. All right, so first things first, uh, when I was planning this electrical uh, install, I had to kind of see what we had. So this is a 30 amp system, which was different than the 50 amp system that I previously worked. 50 amp systems are kind of weird, like in naming, because it's actually two lines of 50 amp, and it's split phase electricity. But um, 30 amp systems have only one, and so they have two hot lines, one neutral, and then a ground. But a 30 amp system like this truck camper actually only has uh, 30 amps and it's one hot, one neutral, and, and a ground. And so it's actually a lot simpler uh, and has been a little bit easier for me to kind of determine how it all comes together. But even here in the truck camper they kind of have things split out in two different places. Um, in terms of where the big electrical components are and that's because space is at a big premium here. So I guess starting off here in the back, I'll try to show you, uh, we took out all the cabinets for painting, so it made it a little bit easier, but here in the back you can see this little silver box. This is the old battery box and it was vented to the outside. And then coming in from the battery box, you can kind of see the two wires there. That's the positive and negative lead from the battery and it came here to a battery disconnect switch. Uh, and I actually found it pretty interesting because I've already moved it to the front, and I'll show you in a minute, but instead of using like your traditional red switch, like this, that you find in most RVs, this is your battery disconnect switch in most RVs, they actually installed this thing down here, which is called a latching relay. And so instead of having a physical switch, uh, they actually had the, the panel here has a little button and this button would engage the relay one way or another and that would allow electricity to pass through or not. I actually watched a couple videos on it because I'd never like uh, understood how they work, never heard of them before and I thought it was pretty interesting. So, um, so yeah. So that was your, your battery disconnect, and then there was just a pull here with a bunch of the negative lines connected to it, and then one went to the battery, and then there was another big one, and these big one aught cables down here led down to the generator, which I didn't include in my original install planning, but I think I've come up with something to, uh, to solve that problem, because I don't really want to run one aught cable up to the battle borns and they're not really made for starting things like that uh they can do it but they're just not made for it um and then the other thing i found was there was actually still power coming in even after i disconnected everything and there's no batteries in here i've taken the batteries out but uh i found that there's the original solar charge controller it's just like a dumb pwm charge controller was plugged in and the solar panel was working and so these cables led down here to the battery as well so i'm actually going to be reusing those um not to go to the battle borns but for something else and we'll talk about that later but overall this is the first part i kind of just looked at the wires and i know that i still need to connect you know there's there is some other wiring done here so i'm going to have to connect this to my new setup but overall, everything comes up to here. And this is our distribution box. And here on the left, we have our AC power. And on the right, we have our DC power with all the fuses. So these are our AC breakers and DC fuses. So 
pulled that out, took a look at everything that we had in there. And um, so, yeah, I mean, it looks pretty simple. There's not that many uh, actual, like, wires or, I guess, cables coming to this. It's a small distribution box, which is, which is good. And I don't need to move that many things. Um, for my install, I kind of had to, like, draw it out, which I have over here. And I, I always like to start with that, well, A, determining what we have, and then B, I'll try to get a picture of this and show it, but what do I kind of want? And so that helps me size the system that I am going to need and tries to help me plan the project so that I purchase everything I need for it. Because I feel like these projects, especially even this one so far, has been delayed day after day because I need to get something off of Amazon or run to Home Depot or Lowe's. And so planning tries to eliminate most of that. But as I said with the generator, sometimes you still do miss things. Anyway, uh, so in the truck camper, space is at a premium, which is completely different from our fifth wheel. And so I think one of the things that I'm going to have bigger problems with here is finding the space for everything. And I've because we had the cabinets off, I was able to uh, kind of see the space that we had available that was like hidden in the walls here. But we also took off the basement and that'll make it easier for me to run cables. And I found a ton of space under there. And so that's where I'm gonna be utilizing. Most of these components actually are gonna be hidden under there, uh, which you can only do with lithium. If we were using any other kind of batteries uh, they would still need to be vented and I'd probably put them back in this this box back there and we'd lose that like accessible space but because these are lithium and battleborn and they're maintenance free uh, I can just put them in the basement make them accessible if I need to I mean it's just taking off like 20 screws I can get to the basement again but still keeping them where they're out of the way and uh, I don't have to maintenance them like every month like I would with lead acid. All right, so uh, I'll, sh I'll, I'll go out and show you that in just a minute, but overall, I'll just show you real quick what I did in here already to kind of prepare the space. Uh, I still had to kind of track down wires and trace wires, so I did find these are the cables that are coming from the truck. Um, and you can see like the little umbilical cord comes in here and here's all the other like uh, wires coming from the truck for trailer lights. And those go to the little fuses, fuse box here. This is for an, um, this is for our jacks. That's what all these power cables are for, positive and negatives for, for all of the jacks. And this is a transfer switch. And so the transfer switch allows the trailer to be powered from either the generator or from the shore power if it's plugged in. So that's it. Uh, the, the main things I did in here was kind of just move everything. So this was kind of laying horizontal and I moved it up vertical. Uh, it gave me so much more space in here. Uh, this transfer switch was actually down here in this like empty cavity in the basement, which I'm going to be using for, uh, I think I'm gonna put the batteries in here. And so that I just moved it up here and I already test fit it with the distribution box to make sure that they fit. And then I moved that battery disconnect up here and I'm still gonna use that um, because I thought that the latching relay idea is pretty cool. So let's go look at the basement real quick. I haven't really done anything under there except for um, just move some stuff around. You can already see them sweating because man, it is hot. And it's been raining every day, so it's also humid, which is uh, pretty crappy. But <clears throat> let's see. So I've already kind of uh, re-insulated a lot of this area, but it was so neat taking off the underbelly because you got to see the tanks, which I don't know how well this will show up on camera, but this tank here, is actually in an L, or it's in a U shape even actually. And so they use these little blocks to uh, lean it all in that direction towards the exit port. But they put this uh, kitchen gray tank 
in this U shape because it has to it has to like wrap all the way around to the shower and then to the kitchen and then it comes back it's to to the exit so it's it was pretty crazy seeing that but um, other than that there's there's plenty of space to run cables along the side here and then I found this huge open compartment here and this is all heated because uh, it has the tanks in here and that's just how Lance Bree did it. And here's our fresh water tank. So I was able to look at that and it looks pretty good. Um, but so in here, I think I'm actually gonna put the Multi Plus because like I said, I'll be able to access it if I need to, but uh, most of the time I don't really touch it. And I do, I do have a, a color control system like I had in the previous RV and that will allow me to turn it on and off remotely. But the thing I like about putting the MultiPlus in here is the inverters put off a, like a decent amount of heat, right? And so this actually will put it in between the gray tank and my and the black tank and my freshwater tank. And this area is still vented up into the trailer. There is like a couple of vents over there and uh, but overall, that like extra waste heat will go to actually keeping these tanks warm, which will be really, really nice in the winter. And then another thing that I found uh, because of our multi pluses in the fifth wheel and where they are mounted, it actually like the heat rises, right? And it warms the floor. And that's really, really nice. Um, this is like the main walking area, like down the center of the floor. So if it warms the floor, that's just... And, even better added bonus but anyway from from this big open section that also is is heated like there's a ducting right here and it just kind of pours opens up heat in here to just heat the tanks so that's that's nice for the the batteries and all that stuff too anyway so there's a cable run from here kind of goes all the way down and then right here is straight down from the electrical distribution panel. So as you can see, there's plenty of space in here. And so I think I'm gonna try to put the batteries here and the MultiPlus back there or vice versa. We'll see what fits. I think the batteries here will probably be a little bit better. I've already measured everything and it's, it's tight. It's tight spaces, but uh, we'll be able to do it. All right, so let's get started now that you've seen this kind of crazy chaos um, briefly, or I've explained it to you, with uh, I wanna run the wires back up here to the front for that battery disconnect before I forget, and I forget which wires uh, need to go there. And uh, then I think one of the first things I'll wanna do is mount the multi plus and then i'm actually going with a lynx distribution center to make wiring easier a little bit more clean um, and i have a shunt in there as well so i don't have to have the battery disconnect but let's get started going because it's hot and I'm by myself but I was able to pull that cable let me turn this fan off uh, I was able to pull that cable and I got that um, battery disconnect hooked up so now on to the next project which is for me uh, installing our DC to DC charger so this will allow us to charge off of the alternator uh, of our truck while we're driving and you can do this whether you have a travel trailer or a fifth wheel or uh, class a whatever you can charge off of the the alternator that your engine is already um, running and so while this might uh, you know it adds a little bit of horsepower because you're adding resistance and all that so you are paying for this it's not just free energy um, you're paying for it in fuel but 
relatively, it's a great job. Uh, it It's a great idea for at least the coaches that are always connected and uh, smaller coaches where you're not able to put as much solar on. Um, I think that DC to DC charging makes a lot of sense. Um, but it makes a lot more sense on things like class A's and class C's and truck campers because they're almost always connected to the engine and so you might as well uh, just take some power from that while you're moving around. All right, so the next step in the process is uh, to run my wiring. So I do have the cables coming here from the truck. So this positive will go into the positive here. This is a non-isolated, so there's actually only uh, three connectors. So it'll go into the inside of my Orion DC to DC charger. This negative or ground or neutral, whatever you want to call it, will uh, actually go to the distribution block, which is right there. And then I'll run a line from the distribution block into the ground there. And then I'll run the positive out is actually uh, going to go right here. And I implemented a physical battery switch. So then it goes the physical battery switch to this little breaker. Uh, this is a 40 amp breaker to monitor the, the voltage coming in and out. And this is an auto resetting breaker. And then there's a bunch of leads off of here. I think most of this stuff, uh, so this stuff will all get charged from the truck or from its connection back to the distribution panel. And this will power all the lights and um, everything else in here, the, the leveling jacks and all that. So the reason I added this uh, manual switch is because in my distribution box here, I have two positive leads coming off of it. One positive lead goes to here and um, is a, this is that disconnect that is controlled up there. And then the other positive lead goes here. And I don't see really many cases for me turning this off, but just in case I wanted to be able to uh, disconnect this. And so there you go. All right, so uh, let's get to finding a place to put this. I think it's gonna fit right in here. So I think I'll want to do the wiring and all that before I, I get it settled. All right, so I finished the DC to DC connector install. Here, let me give you a quick look. All right, uh, and just to update, I actually broke this 40 amp auto resetting breaker. So I do have to purchase a new one, um, but I kind of reconfigured uh, my layout just a little bit here. I actually went and put the disconnect switch. It's in between all of the loads here and the, the distribution panel. So that way, if I want to disconnect all of these loads completely from the battery, I can do that. Uh, before I had it in between the truck and the DC to DC charger, and so that would have disconnected it, but that's the same thing as unplugging the truck. And so if I wanna stop power coming through the DC to DC charger, I can just literally unplug it from the truck, and then this will allow me to disconnect these loads from the battery while we're in storage. So it goes, distribution, battery disconnect, um, and that's that automatic one, and then distribution to manual battery disconnect. I mounted that up right there. All of this also has like a step cover, so I'll be able to get to it if I need to, um, and that's really nice. And then I mounted this here, and I just put it in with just some screws into some plywood I added here, and so that gives it plenty of room to kind of like vent up and down, there'll be space there. 
and then uh, there's actually a vent right here. So airflow will be able to go in here. And yeah, so that's all set up. I already ordered a new 40 amp auto resetting breaker right here uh, from Amazon. You can pick those up from like auto parts stores if you want. So then once that gets here, I'll connect all of these load wires on one side and then this wire, which comes from the, the charger on another and this will be completely done. Working in a small space is absolutely the hardest part about this project. Um, so far, everything is uh, easy because it's 30 amp and it's like pretty straightforward. It's just like really tight, tight areas and I have to make sure everything has airflow and movement. And also uh, like the breaker itself, this is a 2005 truck camper. So this breaker is probably from 2005. So as I'm moving stuff around, I'm kind of like tugging on stuff and like uh, just trying to see if anything, if it gets a little bit of strain on it, if it's gonna break. Uh, I've already had like one or two of these like little plastic crimp connectors that they've had uh, kind of pull off. So I re-crimp them. And I would rather do all that stuff now while I have all the tools and I have everything with me rather than uh, be driving down the road and be in like Alaska and have one of these little crimp connectors break and not get access to like something, right? The AC if it's like the thermostat wire or something. Anyway, all right, uh, let's see. So next thing is I think going to be mounting the multi plus and so I'm going to go underneath and I've already mapped out where I want it but I need to make sure that I have the correct length of screw and since we're uh, installing new flooring in here I'm 99% sure that the screw length I got will be fine but it's going to be coming up from underneath and so I'm just going to go test screw it through. There's nothing here, it's literally just uh, you know, vinyl. Underneath that is plywood, insulation, plywood. So, let's see. For the Multi Plus, and um, it is heavy. We got the, the 3000. That's all you need for a 30 amp. You could probably get away with a 2000 if you want to be mindful of your loads. But uh, when talking with Battleborn, um, saying that we wanted to power like everything, they recommend the 3000. So that's perfect. It's uh, We had two of those in our grand design. So I really like the 3000s. Um, but they are heavy, so they do come with this little mounting bracket and they usually hang down on this. Um, but it does a pretty good job of being able to like kind of hook the multi-plus on there and then screw it all down. So uh, for our... Uh, RV and where I'm placing it. I wanted to give it a little bit more wood, but I built this little platform so I can go kind of screw this in all into the RV without any weight on it and then hang the multi plus and add the two bottom screws. I was originally just going to do a plywood backer plate on there, but the space that I have to put it in is just a little bit too small um, because there is part of the aluminum frame going through there and the aluminum frame is only one inch so it's not that big of a deal but I just have to kind of raise the multi plus above that and unfortunately uh, if you didn't know like in the lumber industry like a one by three is not actually one inches it's like three quarters of an inch so it was still lower than the frame, so I had to do the backer wood plus the plywood. So that should get me 
a little bit uh, deeper than one inch here, so I'll be able to mount that, which I'm gonna go do now. As you can see, it is now mounted up there. It's hanging down, it's real solid. So that thing's not coming down. Uh, the other great thing about this is I am actually probably gonna put a little insulation right here and then it still is gonna be sitting on the basement floor. So that should give it additional little bit of cement because then Unlike a travel trailer, or fifth wheel, or anything else, this basement floor actually sits in the bed of the truck. So it's gonna be, you know, that's gonna be supported. Uh, the basement floor, I just rebuilt it to be a little bit thicker too. And so it's just gonna be extra supported. So next up is actually doing the Lynx system. All right, so this is the actual Lynx system. Uh, so I have it already kind of installed, but they come individually. There are three different systems. Lynx distribution, Lynx shunt, and Lynx power in. Take off the tops. And so just the, the basics of it are the power in is where you connect your batteries, the shunt here, uh, monitors all um, power as it goes back and forth right here with the shunt and it actually gives you a spot for a fuse so it's also going to serve as our main fuse for both the batteries and as you can see here I already have some fuses installed um, and then this is the distribution so the distribution and the power in are essentially the same except for the distribution has this little board here which uh, monitors the power and if a fuse is blown uh, the fuses will go across here and if a fuse is blown you'll see this thing's got little LED lights so a little LED light will glow right there and it'll tell you which fuse is blown. Uh, the power in doesn't come with fuses uh, and you don't need them but I like to fuse as much as I can um, because I'm not an expert and so uh, I have a blog post about how to add these posts right here so that way you can fuse them because these these posts aren't aren't here by default uh, usually you just run the cable all the way up to the bus bar so when these come, they all come with these little caps and you just remove this little silicone cap and it just shows this big bus bar. As you can see, it's a substantial piece of metal. And so this shows the positive bus bar all the way through. So you have very little resistance. You don't have to run any wires to connect it all and it just works. And so that's positive, and then if you flip these covers up, you actually run your negative or ground cables here. So there you go, and it is connected here as well. All right, so I'm going to, uh, let's see, mark out on here where the different screw holes are going to be, and I'm going to uh, pre-drill pre those holes.
so it's been a minute. Um, it's been about a month since we were last trying to fit the batteries in the basement and that location that we measured just wouldn't work because of course, while there's enough space up in that enclosure where I met, where I actually measured, uh, we can't get the batteries in there. There's like nails and screws and all this other stuff that's just like, you know, an inch too thin. And like, it's just really, really tight space. And so we kind of uh, just delayed the project a little bit while we thought about it. And then uh, we realized that the next best option for us was if we can get them into the storage compartment right here. Um, and the only way we could do that is we had to take the door off. So at least they're gonna be nice and secure because once we put the door back on, you're not gonna be able to get these batteries out. But overall, uh, I just reinforced the floor here and uh, covered it because it was only half floor. That was like a flimsy little uh, piece of one eighth glue on there, which wouldn't withstand the weight of the batteries. Yeah, everything's ready to go to slide the batteries in and bolt them together. Um, and then in the meantime, we also finished up everything underneath, all the wiring, um, all the cabling, and I put disconnects for these battery cables right here. So I was able, able to even put the fuses on and everything's running in the RV just uh, right now off of the MultiPlus. It's, you, uh, providing power to the DC side. So it's awesome, we have the AC running and all the lights are working. So I actually decided to replace the bottom of uh, the truck camper. It was previously covered by just a piece of Luon and then they have some sort of material on it. It's not, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's like a waterproof material-ish but I wasn't able to find any of that. So I actually just replaced it with 1 8 Luon and then FRP board, which I was able to get at Lowe's. And it's nice, it's waterproof. It's got that nice little texture to it. So I think that'll look really, really nice, really simple, just uh, screw it all back on. So I'm, I'm excited to uh, get it back together and uh, let's see how it looks. So everything's installed and before I show you the final Battleborn install, I wanted to come back to uh, the area back here because I finally figured everything out and installed everything and tested it and it's all working. So uh, I'm happy to share what I did. The problem I had was that the generator cables came back here and they were big thick cables for starting the generator and I didn't really want to start them off of the Battleborn. So I got a lithium battery by NOCO and uh, it's actually for starting like ATVs and jet skis and stuff like that and so NOCO also makes those uh, lithium battery car jump starters we actually have one for our truck and so they kind of like I don't know pioneer the lithium starter battery market for smaller engines anyway um, so I got a 4 amp one and it can handle up to 500 amps of continuous current for starting the battery uh, of the or starting the generator and so that is enough based on the documentation i can't remember what it was but it was not 500 and so i installed that and i put those battery leads directly to it and it works great um and then you have a second battery in here so you have to figure out how to charge it and the other cables that were back here already that I didn't extend were actually uh, coming from this right here, which is a 
solar charge controller for one solar panel, like a really old mono solar panel that's on the front of the truck camper. And so I decided to leave that and I just upgraded to some uh, cheap solar charge controller that can handle lithium. So I just replaced the solar charge controller, ran the same same batteries and so that one panel recharges this this battery and it hasn't been an issue whatsoever except for it's an old generator and there was one day where it was having trouble starting so we were like really hammering it like holding the button down and it just completely killed it so uh luckily i was able to jump start the generator from outside and it worked just fine um but I think in the future I'll probably add, they have like, NOCO also sells like a little charger that you can plug in and just plug it into 120 volts. So the next time um, we start the generator, it'll then charge the battery again because it's only four amps, so it should charge relatively fast. All right, so all of that fun stuff. Uh, the other thing we did finish is actually we put four 100 uh, watt, watt <laughs> solar panels on the roof, just flexible. We got kind of like a step up from the standard flexible panels. They're a little bit more uh, robust because, I don't know, people have had not the best um, with the super cheap, super flexible ones. You know, they could crack and catch fire. So these ones are a little bit more protected, I guess. Um, and they seem to work out well, but they also come down here uh, just straight down and we put the Victron solar charge controller down here that is tied into all the rest of our system. So we just have them, I believe in series. So it's kind of like right at the top limit of this solar charge controller, but it works great. Uh, so let's go outside and check out the final install. All right, so that's the install on our truck camper, and you know, Overall, I think some of the best benefits of the Battleborns is they just work and you can kind of put them anywhere, which is really nice. I also love that you don't have to worry about them like causing too many issues or really worry about them at all. No like, maintenance. No maintenance. Kind of really, really nice because we like just the set it and forget it kind of thing. And also, I really like that when you buy the Victron stuff from them, it all comes pre-configured because while I'm finally getting a hang of it now, it took a long time of messing with things to make sure that all the settings are correct and right. And you know, it's all very personal to your situation and your batteries and all of that. And so it can be a little confusing, but when they buy them from Battleborn, they just come working for the Battleborns, which is great. But yeah, that's it. Uh, if you have any questions, comment down below uh, and we'll be happy to answer them. All right, so this video is very exciting for us because it's about floors and we are almost done with them. So we've spent, um, I don't know, a few hours over three days laying them down and I'm going to go in the truck camper and show you it, obviously, but then also yeah. share some tips and tricks as I worked through that process, which actually wasn't that bad. No, um, and we went with linoleum, vinyl plank, or whatever LVP stands for. Um, <laughs> luxury vinyl plank. Oh yeah, luxury vinyl plank. Yes. And I think it looks really nice. I mean, it really depends. This is where if you put money in and like you can find a good, looking one you know there's definitely different levels of lvp out there at least for me mm -hmm. uh and i think we chose a really good one and then you also have to factor in the weight and yes. i feel like that was the hardest thing was finding a lighter weight uh plank that looked good yes but so we did it i hear Neighbors slamming car doors, there's a helicopter, and the cicadas are starting to go nuts. So let's bring you inside the rig so we can actually talk to you. All right, so these are the floors. We're really pleased with them. Um, I wanted to show you like how we put them in 
because again, over it was a couple hours for over three days that we did this. So we did the main floor, the slide out, and then we actually did a section in here. This is the bedroom area in the closet. And we only took it out two rows from the closet door because our bed is going to reach the closet. So it's gonna go from the window to the closet. So we really only wanted two planks underneath. We don't really care about planking the whole thing because it's added weight and no one can see it. So we are gonna figure out like a different type of material to put here, um, to put the bed on top of so we have some insulation. But yeah, so I wanted to show you the products that you're gonna need if you're gonna do this. And just kind of how they go in together. So we actually just got this floor uh, installation kit from Lowe's. And then this is the brand that we got. So we got the SmartCore Pro, also from Lowe's. And we went with a waterproof option because when you're searching for them, you're gonna find options that you either need to put a pad under or it already comes with a pad kind of built in. We also went with that option and I'll show you. You can get partial waterproofing or you can get like full waterproof. So because, you know, these floors are going to take a beating and they're going to be in our bathroom, in our kitchen, next to the sinks, we wanted them to be waterproof. And then obviously Carmen is the sloppiest drinker, so she's gonna get water all over these floors. So with that said, this kit came with the hammer. It did come with spacers, which we ended up not using. Um, and then these two tools that you can use with the hammer to kind of either hammer them like away from the wall or hammer them towards different, towards the wall or you know, the different corners that you're working with. You're also gonna need a razor blade and what are these even called? Just a right angle? Square. A square. <laughs> you're gonna need a square. And I used this, uh, our level a few times just to cut the extra long pieces and make sure that I was getting a straight line. So the way that these floors work is they literally just lock in and you have to go from left to right. And so they're made where like the left side has the locking mechanism on the bottom and the right side, which you can't see here, but you can see on here, it has the locking mechanism for the next set of planks on the right side. So that's how they lock in and you literally just line them up, lift them up and then push it down and you can, you know, hammer it in if it doesn't go in all the way. So they're actually really easy to put together. The hardest part about this was simply just measuring everything and because this is such a weird space we wanted to make sure that like the seams were spaced out evenly so we watched we purchased um rv family reno's renovation course and so she has a, a couple uh episodes or lessons on flooring and so that really helped us choose what floor to go with and then also how to space these out so you can kind of start to see a pattern where you have like a full board 16 inches 32 inches and then a full board so it's actually really easy to get the spacing nice and pretty looking when you have a flat side that you're working on from the left but when you're working with these <laughs> multiple different starting points on the left yeah you have a little bit of a harder time spacing it out and then to be honest like making sure that the bathroom lined up into the kitchen so like making sure this board was going to line up with this board <laughs> was a little bit tricky but we did it we figured it out so today Sorry, a little sweaty here. <laughs> we had to turn the AC off. So today we are finishing up the trim. So as you can see here, we also do need to cut these two boards because they go over the edge, you know, about an inch. But because we have like a kick plate or a, what is it technically called? Yeah, kick plate. 
Sure. <laughs> trim. Because we have a piece of trim that we need to put there and that glues down and then snaps in, we have to measure oh, that first. Stair nose. Stair nose. There it is. So that's what we're going to be doing today. And we would have already had that done, except we're realizing that the more handy you get, or the handier you get, the more freaking tools you need. So we want to show you our new tool that we just bought. All right. So we finally decided to get a miter saw as excited. I, uh, I was, uh, cutting miters with that little miter box and saw that we got uh since this is going to be like final or finishing touches i just didn't think that it was going to be as clean um as we would like and so uh, since we are thinking about buying a house in the future i thought might as well get a miter saw i'm sure we'll use it and uh yeah so while at the store I was gonna get like their small portable one uh, that was battery operated and it was like 200 something bucks and then this big one that can do more and is sliding and all that jazz was like 30 more dollars so we decided to just get the big one so no matter what wood or if we get big <laughs> fancy beams in our house or what are those, those things on the bottom called molding well, it's crown molding at the top and baseboards at the Baseboards, <laughs> yeah. If we get big old school baseboards uh, yeah. in our house, then we can cut it, so. Yes, I think yeah. this is definitely now the largest tool we own. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I think we got a little too excited to try out the miter saw because we read the instructions, we got it all set up, we tested a bunch of different little, you know, cuts here with some scrap wood, we figured it out, and then we were like, okay, let's get started, and then we'll do an update. So we went in to do our first measurement in the truck camper, and the stair nose that we measured, we can't actually put it on because we still need to do, we need to glue the remaining wood. We'll call it the kick plate for that, yeah. We'll call it the kick plate, okay. We still need to glue on like the leftover pieces that we have of the floor onto the kick plate <laughs> of the stairs. So we can't actually, you know, put the cap on until both sides of the floor are there. So that's what we're gonna spend the rest of the day doing is just finishing out um, there's like, I would call it a stair, but, but it's more so the wheel well where the toilet is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is very, uh, informative, I hope. So anyway, so our toilet, we still need to do like that area, um, and like three like sidings. So with that clear explanation, <laughs> let's get started. Cutting our pieces to size here and I think we're about ready to go you know I do want to say that the floors like if you're gonna take on a project like this this isn't necessarily hard it's just time-consuming because you have to work from left to right they own they only interlock a certain way so I've been like double checking and triple checking my measurements because I also don't want to waste any pieces. So like when you have to cut a short piece on the right side, it's not like you can use the rest of that piece on the left side. So you have to like really think about it. I've been saving like my left pieces and my right pieces so that way I can try and use as much of the floor as possible without wasting any. And then you obviously want to double and triple measure because you could waste some that way. So I have messed up a couple times, I have to admit, where I've 
thought, okay, this is where I need to measure it, and then I cut it, and then I realized that was the wrong side. So thankfully I've been able to save those pieces and reuse them elsewhere. So I actually haven't wasted much at all, which is really good. And uh, so we have this random little section here between the wall and our slide out. So I actually took extra pieces. These are like the middle pieces when you have to cut a left side and a right side. So they only connect now on the top and the bottom. I kind of thought they were going to be trash, but I was able to reuse these pieces and I'm just going to actually slide them in here. Here, I'll, I'll show real quick. <laughs> so then they fit right in there. And once it has some trim around it, it's going to look really nice. So we're actually going to glue these three pieces down because they're not interlocked really on the left or the right side. And we don't want them sliding underneath our slide out. So we'll glue those little three pieces down. So that also reminds me another reason we chose this type of floor was because we didn't have to glue it down. It's called like a floating floor. So once they interlock, they kind of just all hold each other into place. And you do actually want some gaps because they expand and retract based on the weather. So we have left some gaps here as well. So I think that's about it. Um, I feel like there was one more, oh there was, I just remembered it. We also got this floor because the bottom has the padding already glued on. So that way- Underlayment. Underlayment, okay. I've been real technical today. So that way we didn't have to buy underlayment and then put floor on top of it. We could literally just, it's all one thing, easy click and lock into place and you're good to go. So this has been a, a fairly easy project just time consuming. So with that said, we went ahead and we cut out our pieces for the kick plate. <laughs> uh, just kind of like where the wheel goes, I guess, when we're backing up our truck. However, this was all carpeted before. So I think it's gonna look really good. This is four pieces that we had to cut and we're just gonna glue them on here. And to prep the surface, we sanded first to kind of rough it up and then we used alcohol to clean it all off and we vacuumed before that so sand vacuum alcohol to get all the remaining dust off and then we're gonna glue and stick it to it so i think it's gonna look really good and let's get to it All right, day four of working on the floor. <laughs> Although, eh, we didn't really do that much uh, yesterday. So yesterday, as you saw, we put all the weights up. <laughs> A very official system here when we put this kick plate thing on. Um, and so, yeah, that's on there great. And it looks really good. I should have shown it to you before I brought this slide out, but oh well. So I brought the slide out a little bit. I glued down the three pieces in here and I put some weights on there. So those are looking good. And then I put on the trim piece that goes um, on the top of the slide here. So once we get all the trim on here, it's going to look so good. I'm really excited. I feel like I'm starting to see a light at the end of the tunnel with this renovation, with the paint being done, and now the floor's almost being done. Um, the next big project is the shower walls, but that's for another video. So yeah, we're gonna let this dry overnight. 
um, take everything off and then we can actually start doing like the trim pieces up here but meanwhile today we're actually going to start trim everywhere everywhere else in the RV so oh actually what I'm going to work on right now because Jason's preoccupied with trying to get the frog off our awning um, I'm going to start working on the toilet area and using like our scrap pieces of wood for that because we bought six pieces and you get the frog off? <laughs> yeah, he's successfully in a bush, safe. Oh good. We only have three full pieces of wood left. So, I need to be able to do our two stairs in the entryway and this. So here's all the scrap wood. I'm gonna start putting pieces together and hopefully <laughs> we have enough because I'd hate, hate to buy like one more box just for like a piece. I was able to finish out the bathroom and entryway with the three planks I had left, so we didn't have to buy another box. We then quickly finished up the trim and the end results are better than we expected. You'll be able to see more of the floor in our post renovation walkthrough video. Subscribe to our channel so you don't miss it. Hey guys, the bathroom renovation is complete. It was a lot of work to get here, so I think the only way to show it to you is from the beginning. This is our custom fit shower pan and it uh, feels pretty lightweight, which is good. We had a hell of a time trying to find a new shower pan or kind of figure out what we want to do, whether we wanted to kind of make one custom or uh, like do it ourselves. We've seen a lot of people use like shims and expanding foam and kind of create their own custom shower pan. And then other people have fiberglassed it and that was a little too much for us. Um, we even were like, okay, the truck camper has such a custom shower plan area. We even tried calling duo form who create created like the original shower pan. And because it's a 2005, they're like, oh, this is old. We don't have that. We'll have to even see if we have the mold in stock, um, to create it again. But to even get to that point, we called them and they said they don't sell direct to consumer to call someone else. And so then we had to call their like distributor. distributor and then he had to call them and then it was just this whole cluster and they're like it'll take a couple months and we don't have that 
just to even get an answer. To get an answer of whether or not they still have the mold <laughs> and they had someone walk back there and just check to see if they can make us the, the right. same shower pan. And then even longer to, to get, get it, it done. <laughs> yeah, because then it would go into their huge queue. All right, anyway, uh, so we weren't that happy with that answer and we needed it now. Uh, so I did find this built with foam company, builtwithfoam.com, and they will custom print a foam shower pan and curb to whatever size you want. And this is kind of similar to the home style, like uh, Schluter Curdy, but uh, Schluter Curdy is like the foam one that people use in their houses. And so we almost did that, but it's like really exp expensive. So we went with built with foam. So I'm excited. We haven't actually seen what this looks like yet. Uh, so I'm very excited to open it, see what it looks like, and then uh, get it in there for a test fit just to make sure that I didn't mess up ordering it. <laughs> Luckily, it is foam though, so as long as it's not prohibitively small, we should be able to modify it to fit what we need. But it was really easy ordering this. Uh, their online system had an issue, so I actually called them. They had me send an email with the dimensions and they had it to us. I think it's, that was Friday. Yeah, and it's already Wednesday. Yeah, I paid Sunday afternoon and it's Wednesday and we already have it here. Oh yeah, look at this, it's like custom fit in here. <laughs> it's actually, it's like really dense foam. Yeah. Oh yeah, it is. So, um, Figuring out how to get this out. Yeah, gonna figure out how to get this out and then we'll go test fit it. Ooh. I'm like scared. <laughs> scared you're gonna break it. Yeah. Could you imagine ripping our new shower pan in half the second we get it? Remember how we said we were gonna be super organized during this <laughs> renovation? Hmm. I feel like something happened. Okay. <laughs> oh. That's our drain, right? That's, yep, that's our, our drain and kit. And that one's specially made for foam pans, so it's perfect for RVs. Yes, and it uh, is ABS, just like we we wanted, so that's good. All right, I am getting anxious. So it actually tells you, like, this piece is scrap, so you know yeah, what this, you are actually meant to use. This and this is our Dang, I keep calling it a dam, but what's it actually called? Curb. Curb, okay. All right. Cool. 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 And okay. There's our pan. All right. Look at that. Wow. Okay. Like Moment that. of truth. See if it fits. It's not? <laughs> that I'm gonna, well, I haven't moved the shower plumbing yet. Oh, right, right. But, test fit is pretty good. At least once I get that plumbing down. Yeah. Yeah, we're gonna lower the pipe so we could get a couple of more inches in the shower for right. us, since we are tall people. I have to move that wiring a little bit, but yeah. overall, Oh yeah. Oh wow. Like a, it's like a perfect fit. Like a glove. Okay. And then I'm not gonna shove it, but yeah, this... it goes to the ground. Yep. Oh perfect. <sighs> oh, All right. Something went right. <laughs> so uh, I would say so far, if you're looking for a lightweight custom shower pan without installing it or doing anything else, <laughs> ordering it and making sure it fits, built with foam. Perfect. Yeah, so it gives you that nice slope to the drain. Yes. Yeah. So, we're continuing the shower build and we're putting in the shower head because we didn't opt for the traditional exterior 
shower head, which usually has like a motion arm thing right here, and just the two spigots that come out, Yeah. Uh, the mixers, and it connects with like a whatever, <laughs> flexible <laughs> hose on the outside, which is, you know, it's, yeah. we're doing a renovation, might as well make it feel a little bit more like home. Yeah. Since um, we couldn't get the extra six inches on the ground work. Yeah. <laughs> and we actually tried to find a exposed black pipe because it looks really cool. But we weren't able to find any options that we liked. 99% of them were rain shower and like come out and then go down. So it would have been like right here. And I just didn't, you know, yeah. I'm already uh, a little too tall for the shower. So uh, we went with a Delta brand and I think it looks real nice yeah. but doing that means that we have to add plumbing in the wall behind <laughs> the shower which we had access to the lower half uh, because that's the only place that they had plumbing before and so what we did actually was <laughs> cut an access hole so we learned this uh, from yeah, our last RV mm -hmm. and so what you can do is you cut an access hole like this and then you just get another piece of Luan and cut it to the same size as this whole entire cabinet and just add a couple screws in the corners. Mm -hmm. And uh, it allows you to easily remove those screws, pull it off, and you have full access. Yeah. And so we'll do that and we'll just paint it and it'll, it'll look great. Yeah. It'll blend right in. This is actually going to be a coat closet anyway because yeah. we figured it was too small for pantry stuff, we're gonna make the bigger one our pantry, so. Yeah. It doesn't really matter what this wall looks like, to be honest. Yeah, I mean, it's inside a closet, too, yeah. so. So, now we went last night to Home Depot, bought all the fittings we needed, all the extra PEX tubing, and so we will now be installing this shower head, or at least the holes, the access holes for it, before we put up do anything else. Yeah, yeah, the actual tiles and go board and everything like that. Since we're still waiting for that stupid little two inch to one and a half inch connector yep. for the shower pan. Yeah, and let me tell you, <laughs> we went to uh, Lowe's and it is very difficult to find, well, A, ABS parts. I feel like uh, most of the stores don't sell them. They do sell direct replacements, so if you're going from an RV shower to an RV shower or an RV kitchen to an RV kitchen. Like they do have the direct ABS replacement parts. But if you're trying to put home <laughs> level stuff in your RV, it's very difficult to find the exact fittings in the correct material. So we actually had to go from ABS, which is the black plastic, to PVC, which is the white plastic, and you're not really supposed to do that. Um, and then we had to get ABS to be PVC glue. <laughs> and so, anyway, that's just delayed this whole project because Lowe's and all the in-home depot don't really carry ABS stuff anymore. Mm -hmm. And then specifically don't have the weird sizing that we need. Yes. And I don't know, plumbing gives me a headache anyway, so. Hats off to all you plumbers. I feel like maybe once you know it, it's easy, but we deal with it once every uh, <laughs> five Three, years. Yeah, yeah. Five when, years. when we replace a faucet or do something, and I feel like every single time it is a pain. Yep. So anyway, I think we have everything we need in here. So next, uh, now that we have the height, we need to test the depth, how far we want our uh, mm. little faucet head to come out so I can properly support it on the other side. Yep. So like, like that? Like that? I don't know. Let's figure it out. <laughs> I just finished building up the base. I was 
originally trying to plan uh, of taking this base out and it actually gave us, I don't know, it's like six inches of extra space, which is really, really nice. However, today, as I was starting to rebuild the shower, I was looking at the plumbing and just the way it is, it would have, it's very possible to reroute the plumbing, but because the plumbing goes into a vent stack in the back there and I just didn't want to like build this whole shower and <laughs> have it not drain, <laughs> that would have been like the worst case scenario. Yeah. Um, we decided to just go back with the platform and we'll deal with an RV shower in the RV. Yeah. Um, not ideal, but it's also a truck camper. And so <laughs> it's kind of like, it would have been a nice little luxury thing to have yes. an extra five or six inches in the shower. Absolutely. Yeah. But the trouble that we would have to go through with right. plumbing and keeping that vent stack at the exact same height. Yes. And all of that. And trying just... to cut it out, put a new piece in, keeping the vent stack at the same height without messing with it. And then also lowering how the pipe got in there. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it doesn't matter. We just couldn't do it. But yeah, we opted to. To, to leave it alone. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so what I did today though was um, to finish the shower platform here because the foam base needs to be completely level. So I went through and there is a bunch of wood in here. I've really shored it up and uh, <laughs> made this nice flat full surface area for the foam. So let's grab that and do a, a test fit and then uh, we'll We'll have to go to the store to get some some stuff for the plumbing and then we can finish the shower up. We'll get the, the floor in, we'll get the walls up, and then it's tile and like boom. We, we're gonna have to uh, put our shower head in. Mm -hmm. We're going with a, a tall shower head, not in our like a residential shower head. Right. So it's gonna require a little bit more plumbing but not, not a lot, like maybe a single PEX pipe and one connector. And then, yeah, I don't know. Uh, so let's let's grab that foam pan and do a test fit real quick okay. though, because I'm I'm very excited. <laughs> Just feel like it's on level, but yeah, it's definitely yeah. further up in the back right there. Yeah, maybe you need to shave off a little bit more back there. Fits. Yeah, there we go. All right, <laughs> so just a little bit more needs to be shaved off of here, but overall, I mean, yeah, that. Let's just look at it all the way in. <laughs> yeah. Not bad for a custom shower. Not bad. Not bad. And we'll be putting one eighth go board on the side. A one quarter. Oh, that one was the, quarter. The smallest one. Yeah, go board, which is another foam cement board replacement thing and then we'll be covering all of that in red guard waterproofing so we'll have a nice full complete waterproof area it's gonna be nice yep so yeah the most expensive part of our whole remodel so far I gotta say is the shower yeah. yes it's been ridiculous yeah <laughs> but what are you gonna do That looks good. Yeah. Sounds great. Ready? I'm gonna do the foam board shuffle.
I know it may not look like it, but Ray and I are not professional bathroom <laughs> remodelers. As I apply mortar with my fingers. <laughs> As you can see, custom fit shower pan. All right, so that's all done. We tried to use the most minimal amount of mortar that we could underneath. It's really to kind of fill the gaps underneath the foam to make sure that uh, there's not any places where, I don't know, it could break or something. Uh, we'll see, we did get the Ultra Flex 2, which is super flexible and I looked and they do use that in some high-end motorhomes, so hopefully it can withstand the flexing back here, but we'll find out. Um, other than that, yeah, Ray obviously did the actual mortar ring because she has a baking background and has baked hundreds and hundreds of cakes uh, in her life, and so she said it was kind of just like frosting a cake and she found it quite enjoyable, which I wouldn't have. I would have found it extremely stressful. So next up, which is going to take place tomorrow, is we're going to put up our walls, which I uh, will show you. So we are putting up the last piece of go board and go board is basically a cement board replacement substitute. It's super light. And, Do it with one hand. Huh? Do it, Do it with one hand. <laughs> Oops. It's very light. Um, they advertise it as 80% lighter than cement board. So. As you can see, we have decided to actually put it the whole length of this back wall and we're actually going to tile this whole back wall. This is where the toilet goes, this is going to be our sink. We kind of just wanted this to be like a statement piece, but then we also just figured with it being such a small area and water here, water here, water here, why not waterproof it all? <laughs> so that's what we're doing. This is really easy to cut. You just literally use a razor blade or a straight edge and you cut it, you bend it back and you snap it off. So it's been really fun to try and get all these measurements because not everything is a straight line already. So like the top of this wall to the top of this corner is you know some a quarter inch sometimes half an inch off from like the bottom so this has been a little tricky to get all these measurements but that's okay that's what happens in rvs so then um we are taking what is this even called uh this it's cock. a yeah it's a just a sealant cock i guess yeah it's a waterproof yeah. cock though so then we've been using this in between each sheet, putting it in the corners, kind of just shoving it everywhere. We're not too terribly concerned because the step after this is red guard, which is the waterproofing step. Um, obviously these go boards are waterproof as yeah, well. It's but... a belt and suspenders kind of thing. Yeah. If you wanted to, you could just use the go board and then use the sealant and get it in there and put extra sealant through the edges and all of that. But we weren't terribly confident in uh, our 100% sealant edge uh, ability. <laughs> yeah, especially with uh, just knowing how RVs are made and yes. having all these custom angles and all that jazz. So we're mm -hmm. doing belt and suspenders. Mm -hmm. We're using sealant and we'll seal over all these uh, screw holes. Yeah, cement board screw holes. Mm -hmm. But our ultimate waterproofer is definitely going to be the Red Guard. Yes. Yep. So this is our last piece. I'm gonna put this on, screw it in, and then we should be good to red guard. Yeah. Okay. One step at a time.
This is a technique Ray learned. <laughs> uh, from frosting? <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta <laughs> full fist the frosting. <laughs> yeah. All right, so we haven't given you an update on the bathroom, but we have done so much. Uh, first off, red guarding was completed and we did what's called a water test, water level test, something like that. Anyway, where you plug the drain, you fill it up, and then you wait 24 hours to see if the water level has gone down or any of that. And while ours didn't go down, since we can see the plywood underneath the shower, we were able to see it was moist. And so we added uh, another two layers of red guard. Uh, and this is what you're supposed to do, because apparently we didn't get it thick enough. So we added some more to make sure we got it thick enough. And we did another water test and it passed. So that allowed us to move on to the next step, which is completely tiling the floor and we went with actual penny tiles and we're just keeping them the floor since it's a small area we're not adding too much weight and we went with a very flexible um i forget the words now thin set <laughs> and a flexible mortar uh so we're hoping that that will um work they do use tile in some higher end RVs uh, and thin set and mortar. So we'll just, we'll see how it goes. Um, yeah, we'll be your guinea pig. <laughs> yeah, and, and definitely, I don't know if I would do it everywhere, but we were happy to do it in this very small area. And now now that the, the tile is all done and it looks beautiful, uh, which I don't know if you agree, but I think it looks amazing. <laughs> Uh, we're moving on to the side of the shower and so You know, we have multiple layers of waterproofing and we didn't want to do tile for the side because that's just so much extra weight uh, So we actually found these palisade They're like, I don't know, I'll call them PVC tiles uh, that click and lock together and form a waterproof barrier and so uh, it's gonna be really nice we'll be gluing them to the wall and then putting a little bit of sealant in between the seams so for us and our homemade shower we're gonna have the waterproof tile on top of the waterproof membrane on top of the waterproof go board so uh, I think our walls will be sufficiently protected um, but Ray has done a great job already laying the very bottom row of tiles, which if you know anything about tile work for the sides of a shower, the bottom row is the most important. You get that straight and then gives you a nice foundation to build upon. So she's already done that and we kept that off camera because um, she was swearing <laughs> like a sailor. And so now we're gonna go ahead and move on to the next rows. process is easy but also confusing <laughs> and uh, it's just like the, the way the product is it's it's an easy process right it's a tongue and groove but the way they manufactured the tongue and grooves to give you like this front grout line they look very similar and so Ray's been in here doing all the work and every <laughs> once in a while I hear a quick cuss word because <laughs> the tile is backwards or something like that because they look so, so similar. And I, I have a hard time 
seeing what's wrong when she's like cussing um, <laughs> about it. But I mean, overall you can see it, it's looking really, really good. They, they, they come together nicely, you know, and it's just a little bit of glue and a little bit of uh, caulk between the seams to keep the, the um, liquid in front of the tiles. And then the, the package we got actually even came with, uh, you can hardly see it over there, especially now that it's focused on the Oh, camera. the trim. But it's this nice little like trim, so it kind of hides the edge. And we decided to go- And we have this trim too. The whole wall, yeah. And then because this is a double-sided, you can kind of mm -hmm. see, it gives you area. And then we do have one last trim for over here. That'll, that's like a V trim that'll cover this whole edge. So, so yeah, it's nice. Um, we got through most of the hard parts now with all of this extra measurement because we decided to come all the way to this side of the wall here. And um, yeah, overall, I think it's looking great and we should be done, I don't know, either later tonight or tomorrow. It's getting, it's already getting pretty late. So it's up to Ray when she wants to call it, but yeah, I, for an RV bathroom, I think it looks amazing as is. Now it's just measure, glue, sealant, measure, glue, sealant, measure, glue, sealant. And that's Ray's life. Hate to do this to you guys, but we're not gonna show you the final results until our final post renovation walkthrough video, which should be coming shortly, but we have a few more projects to share with you in the meantime. Don't forget to subscribe to this video so you don't miss the final walkthrough because I'm so proud of this bathroom. I honestly, I can't wait to show you the final results. So today's project is installing this Acuva Aeromax and Smart Faucet. Uh, one of the things that I particularly am wary about is fresh water in RVs. And in our last RV, we were the only owners, and so we knew the tank and how often it was cleaned. But on this one, it's twice as old as our last RV, or more, I guess. And I had no idea how the people took care of it. Uh, I even thought about replacing it, but when we had the bottom off, I saw this big, massive, custom freshwater tank, and there was no way I was going to find one um, online that fit the exact size, and it would be a pain to get it back where it was. But it did look uh, clean, since they're kind of like opaque see-through, so I didn't see like green growing up around the walls. That being said, I still want nice, clean, fresh drinking water. We are definitely the people who drink from the campground taps or uh, from our freshwater tanks, and we don't want to get like a big Berkey system. So Akiva actually sent us out this unit. Uh, we've seen it uh, in our friend's RV, the Morton's on the Move, have had an Akiva system for a long time. Um, and I just love the simplicity of it. So you don't have to extra filter all of your water. You don't have to do anything, but this system not only filters it, it also uses a UV disinfectant system. So uh, I've already gotten excited and opened up the box and poked around and did some stuff. Um, and so right off the bat, it looks pretty easy to install. Uh, it does come with two power options. And uh, one is like a simple 12 volt hard wire. And I'm gonna keep this because I'll probably install it uh, hardwire 12 volt in the future. But I lucked out and happened to have a unused outlet hidden underneath our counter, just in case this system came with a uh, convection microwave instead of an actual like propane stove. So they just automatically put an outlet down there and it's perfect. So um, I don't have to run this. I'm sure there's like efficiency gains and stuff like that, but at, at this point, I don't care. <laughs> uh, I do love that they include both options though, so that that's great. Uh, other than that, they, they give you everything you need. It's a bunch of compression fittings to make it real easy, and by compression, it means uh, they're just push to connect compression fittings, so you just take this tube and you push it into the fittings they give you, and you'll see that, and they make it real simple to install. Uh, no special tools required. 
Uh, as you can see, it's just a quick little push and you get a nice solid connection. This is the Acuva system itself. And so it just goes under your counter somewhere, wherever you want to put it. And it has an in and an out label and your power. And it's really nice because the power cord screws in here. So you get a nice, like tight power connection. So you're not going to worry about bouncing down the road and having like the power cord fall out. Uh, so this is the system. You will see it's actually really easy to mount. It comes with one of these. This is called a DIN rail. And they use it in like uh, for mounting lots of things, telecommunications, power. Um, but what it is, is you screw this into the wall and then this just clicks onto it. And so it holds it nice and tight, but it's also easy if you like push up and tilt out to take this off if you need to. Uh, and then they do also include a pre-filter. So you'll filter the water. Um, the thing about UV is it kills bacteria and I think viruses and like all that leftover stuff. But if there are big particulates in your water, the UV can't hit them. So having a nice pre-filter right before stops all the big things like um, that are in your water that the bacteria and stuff can hide behind and hide from the UV. So they give you this with a nice little mounting and the final piece of the puzzle is we chose to get a smart faucet. You can plumb this all directly into your faucet if you just want it to come and filter all the water through to your faucet. But we opted to go this route. I think it looks really cool. And it has this nice little glow ring at the bottom to tell you when it's working. So that being said, if you can't tell, I'm excited and it's hot in here. So let's get this install moving. the bed and we're super excited about this this whole process we've kind of just been waiting for it and i feel like this makes it a usable rv Official. with everything officially yeah. making a usable rv so uh we've learned a lot in the last couple of years rving and uh i think that has helped us decide on this whole bed setup so we'll see how this works out but the first layer that is going down is Reflectix. And uh, this stuff is kind of big in RVing. A lot of people will take this and you can cut it out to the shape of your windows and it helps a lot there, kind of reflect the heat back out or reflect the heat back in, in the winter. And so um, if you can't tell from this little guide here, Depending on how you install Reflectix, it can come up with like really big numbers like R21 or it can be as low as R1 and like not doing too much for you. Um, and this is kind of the product that a lot of RV manufacturers will use in like their underbellies to kind of beef up their uh, insulation numbers. Anyway... Uh, what we're doing is we're actually laying this Reflectix down on the base layer. It does need airflow, so we'll get into that to show you. And um, we're doing this because we want... Uh, this area has probably the least insulation of the floor space because this all has like an actual crawl space underneath. And this is just 
an inch of insulation and then the bottom and then a big airspace under the and then the cab of the truck so we'll have nothing here so for us uh this will hopefully reflect some heat back down in the summer and reflect some heat back into the cab and keep it from escaping through the bed in the winter and keep it from getting too cold but um we'll see and we'll let you know so let's get this layer down So the second layer, now that we have the insulation down, we decided to not um, put it over the flooring we have there. We'll see. We can always add more later, um, but we didn't want to kind of like have it wavy. Anyway, so now we have our second layer, which is called Hypervent Airflow, uh, and Mattress Insider sent this to us. And this is important, whether you put the Reflectix down or not. Um, Reflectix only works if there is an air gap. So if you just put your mattress on top of it, you probably wouldn't see the benefits that you're looking for. But with an air gap, it can actually work. Anyway, um, but your mattress in an RV should have an air gap anyway and so mattress insider sells this hypervent airflow material there's a couple of different ways people have uh tried to get boats and rvs to have a little airflow under their mattress and um this is one of them so we're going with this why do you want airflow under your mattress and you want airflow under your mattress to prevent condensation which is followed by mold and mildew uh, so this allows all of your body heat and all the moisture to flow through like in a traditional bed you have like slats that hold your mattress up this allows it to breathe uh, we did actually notice in our last RV that 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 would happen and so we had to keep a close watch on it and that's why we decided uh we needed to do something about it in this rv uh, i was actually worried about it too when we first bought this we like scoured underneath it since we know that there is a lot less insulation here um even though i guess on our rv it was in a slide out so it was still kind of just hanging out there mattress insider is the company we partnered with for our bedding needs uh previously we had a different mattress company and we just didn't like it we had a little falling out uh you can check out the article we wrote about it in the link below um and so we heard a lot about mattress insider and so we're um happy that we we're able to get a custom sized mattress for this space because it does come with like a queen standard, but we did have this like, I don't know, about this much space on one <laughs> side. And with Carmen, Ray and I in a queen bed, it was a little tight. And so we took out that kind of dead space or that little closet space. And we were able to order a custom fit mattress, which you will see next. Um, but before we ordered the custom fit mattress, we were able to order a custom fit hypervent. So let's get this unwrapped and uh, put it out there. Absolutely bored. So the hypervent wasn't a custom shape, but they made sure to give us enough to cover the complete custom shape, which is fine. I think it comes in standard rolls, probably similar to like the Reflectix, right? So uh, not a big deal. It cut really easily with a new razor blade and um, with scissors. 
So yeah, it went down. I think it looks great and I'm excited to see how it works. All right, so now the final stage is the mattress. And so this is a custom size mattress. We're not gonna have to piece anything together. <laughs> Um, and so I don't know about you guys, if you've purchased a mattress online any time in the last, I feel like five ish, six, seven years, it's amazing that they take a full size King mattress, suck it down and roll it up and put it in a box. I mean, cause this is our whole mattress, which is, uh, in between a King and a Queen size. It's, it's definitely a uh, custom size. So yeah anyway so for something like this you got to remember that it will expand and so you want to bring this into the area that you're going to be putting the bed in before you pull it out so you don't have to deal with this big massive mattress um so here we are so we're just gonna pull this out we'll put it up there and then we'll give it i mean a couple of days or hours said to, 24 hours yeah to let it expand again from its air sealed rolled up form but let's see how it goes So it fits like a glove. We were a little worried when we first took it out because it didn't look like it would fit, but it was actually folded in half, which is so crazy to me. Um, and so, yeah, when it finally got all the way laid out, it fits like a glove. And I'm so glad that our measurements were spot on. We were just a little bit worried, um, but I, I love this. I mean, it gives us another six seven yeah. seven eight inches somewhere in there um so i already forgot the custom size i think it's so i think it was 70 by 76 70 by 76 so in between a king and a queen uh really really like it we also opted for i think either the six or the seven inch six six inch um because that got it you can choose that as well when you're making it custom uh, cause I got it right below that window over here. I didn't want it to like be pushed up against the window, the window or yeah. any of that. And that's our emergency exit and you know, safety's first. Um, so from here you can see how awesome this airflow looks, the hypervent airflow or airflow hypervent. Um, so I'm personally really excited for that. And the final step of this whole thing is a custom mattress cover. And so once again, Mattress Insider makes this. We just gave them the dimensions and you see right here, 70 by 76 by six. And so we got a custom mattress cover. We are mattress cover people. So I feel like you're either a mattress cover person or you're not. I don't know. We had one that was like warranted and then we had a mattress on it, cover on it, and it looked brand spanking new after like five or six years of sleeping on it. So uh, that sold me. And here we are. So uh, custom mattress covers. I do think they make all the other custom bedding as well. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a bunch of King stuff, so we'll probably just air on the side of King. I don't know. We'll, we'll see uh, for the sheets and all that, but we have a nice big... Yeah, we might be placing today. a custom order for sheets if uh, the king yeah. or queen sizes don't fit. Yeah, if it's <laughs> looking a little funky. But anyway, that's our mattress setup. We'll give it a couple of days to finish airing out. It already increased dramatically. Mm -hmm. I mean, this whole thing was rolled up and in a box. Um, and so, yeah, we'll just let it continue to expand and settle out. And I'm excited. 
Yes, I think all three of us are gonna fit on there just perfectly. As you guys can see, we are getting down to the last finishing touches. I'll just quickly talk about some of the things we've done. We finished all of our LED lighting, which is what we're gonna use for the most part um, to light up the whole RV. It's really cool. It's up in the corners of the ceiling and it's beautiful. Um, we added a 12 volt Alexa over here. I just had to turn off her speaker <laughs> so she didn't talk to me, um, which is great. It runs off 12 volt and we have it plugged into the new uh, upgraded speaker control unit that we have. The old one was really, really old. Um, and then we've done things like upgrade to um, a Max Fan Deluxe, which we love. Um, we had them in the, the last RV and it's just a great fan. And even a Max Fan Deluxe Mini um, in the bathroom, which was a different type and it fits perfect for the smaller space that we have. But I think it's gonna vent way better than your typical bathroom fan since we weren't able to fit a full Max Fan Deluxe. Anyway, we are so close to finalizing all of the, the rest of the touches here that we can't show you anymore because then it'll be like the, the full reveal. So you're gonna have to wait until our next video, which will be our final walkthrough showcasing everything we've done in this renovation. And um, I hope you guys enjoy.